So what is PIDS? For over 40 years, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies or PIDS has been the country's foremost socio-economic think tank. It conducts rigorous and objective policy research and analyses that help the government in crafting relevant policies, plans, and programs in support of the country's long-term vision and development goals. PIDS pursues its mandate through three basic programs, research, dissemination, and outreach. Through its research program, PIDS identifies and prioritizes studies, develops proposals, and conducts research on priority areas. The results of these studies are then disseminated through different platforms, publications, online resources, PIDS Corner Seminars and the Development Policy Research Month or DPRM held every September. To shed light on key policy issues, the advice and expertise of the Institute's research fellows are also sought by policymakers, government agencies, private sector, and civil society. Since 1977, PIDS has completed numerous policy studies on a wide range of development topics. This brand of service has then translated to policies and programs that have improved the lives of every Filipino. Philippine Institute for Development Studies Service Through Policy Research References for your research? Do you want a recording in progress? Anytime and anywhere? You don't have to look far. Serpy is here for you. Serpy is an online database of socioeconomic materials produced by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Government agencies, research and academic institutions, and international organizations based in the Philippines. It is the country's first online repository of socioeconomic information created for policymakers and development practitioners, researchers, educators, and students. To access SIRPI, just visit the PIDS website and click the SIRPI widget or type serp-p.pids.gov.ph. SIRPI has a wide variety of materials such as journal articles, books, research papers, working papers, policy notes, audiovisual materials, and more. As of 2021, SERPI has more than 50 partner institutions contributing knowledge resources to the database. SERPI provides a comprehensive coverage of references encompassing 22 research themes, labor and education, gender and development, poverty, technology and innovation, trade and industry, and many more. You can search by keyword or author, publication type, research theme, or year published. Therapy has more than 7,000 publications and audiovisual materials that you can access and download for free. What are you waiting for? Visit Serpy now. Socioeconomic Research Portal for the Philippines, Innovating Knowledge Exchange and Policy Research. Dapat po munang alamin or matukoy ang pangunahing problema ng bansa upang mapagtuunan ng pansin at mabigyan ng solusyon. We should have a specific goals, um, do research, and make a policy that is fair for everyone. Walang problema sa polisiya. 
iayos lang ang pagpapatupad. Bago patubas ang batas, pag-aralan mo na gusto ng government. Two things, clarity and execution. Both, you need the communication and monitoring, monitoring, monitoring. As simple as that. Mandato ng Philippine Institute for Development Studies o PIDS na gumawa ng mga pag-aaral at pananaliksik ng mga pulisiya at programa ng pamalaan at magbigay ng rekomendasyon sa mga mambabatas sa pagbabalangkas ng mga pulisiyang makakatulong sa ating bansa. Sinusulong ng aming ahensya ang evidence-based policy making upang bigyan din ang kalaghan ng pulisiya na batay sa datos at policy research na sumusuri sa tunay na kalagayan ng ating mga komunidad. Napakahalaga ng policy research, lalo na sa mga panahong dumadaan sa krisis ang ating bansa. Kapag pulisiya ay pinag-aralan, susulong ang bayan! Good morning. Welcome to the Philippine Apex Study Center Network or PASCN Symposium on Circular Economy in the Philippines and Apex Region, Perspectives, Experiences, and Pathways. I am your host, Abigail Andrada, for today's session. This event is co-organized by the Philippine Institute for Development Studies and the Foreign Service Institute. Before we start the program, I would like to remind you of some house rules. All participants are muted upon entry. You may only unmute yourselves when the moderator calls on you during the open forum. Should you have any questions at any point during the symposium, please feel free to type it in the chat box. Today, the discussions will focus on the perspectives, experiences, and possible pathways towards the advancement of the circular economy in the Philippines and the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Region. Esteemed speakers from the PASEN Network and the APEC Region will tackle sector-specific topics which may answer the following questions. How has the Philippines responded to the circular economy and what are the lessons from its APEC neighbors? What are the local experiences and projects in the Philippines in transitioning towards a circular economy? What are the possible pathways towards circular economy advancement in the Philippines and in APEC? This symposium is one of PASCN's information dissemination programs where researchers can present key findings of their studies and solicit comments from various stakeholders. The first session will focus on the national experiences, while the second session will tackle regional perspectives. With this, we are looking forward to your fruitful engagement during the open forum. To start, may I call on the lead convener of the PASCN and the president of the PIDS, Dr. Aniceto C. Arbeta Jr. to deliver the welcoming remarks. Dr. Obeta, please, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Abi. Uh, Ambassador uh, Jose Maria Carino, 
Director General of the Foreign Service Institute, Assistant Secretary Attorney Anne Clara Cabuchan, Consumer Protection Group, Department of Trade and Industry. Moderators, Dr. Solpicia Ponce, Mindanao State University, Illegal Institute of Technology. Dr. Francis uh, Mark Kimba of the uh, Philippine APIC uh, Studies Center Network of, at the Philippine Institute for Development Studies. Our guest speak, speakers, Dr. Maria Cristina Paler, Ms. Ela uh, Leer Gutierrez, Mr. Jovito Katikbak, Dr. Lily Iliwache, Chitter, and sorry, and Ms. Ngoyin Tu Coin, Dr. Patrick Soder. PACN network members, STEM guests from different government agencies, academic institutions, non-government institutions, PIDS, and Foreign Service Institute colleagues and students, uh, good morning. It is my utmost honor to welcome all of you to the PEC and Circular Economy of the Philippines and, Ap and the APIC region, perspectives, experiences, and pathways. A circular economy, or CE, uh, seeks to means a mainstream and a regenerative restorative system designed uh, by redirecting uh, energy and material flows from linear to circular direction, transforming waste into productive inputs, reducing pollution, greenhouse gases, and their impacts on the health uh, and environment. Accordingly, uh, building a CE entails uh, system thinking of approaches that uh, encompasses modified value systems, creative policies to internalize externalized costs and never a novel means of production, distribution, consumption, and investments. Further, the CE uh, offers uh, strategies such as sustainable procurement, eco-design, industrial and territorial ecology, economics of functionality, responsible consumption, extending the duration of use, and recycling that enable business, society, and environment-friendly economic development. At the regional and international levels, the promotion of a circular economy has been linked directly or indirectly, indirectly to the achievement of numerous sustainable development goals. Notably, APIC countries such as China, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, Singapore, and South Korea have already formulated and implemented their respective CE-related frameworks and policies to capitalize on uh, such an approach. For each part, the Philippines has enacted several laws on, and implemented projects related to CE, but has yet to develop a consolidated CCE-oriented uh, framework. Uh, hence, the organizing committee will collate the key discussions during the symposium and will forward this to concern track one institutions. Today's symposium features speakers from the PACN and from APIC region. The symposium is one of the PACN's information dissemination programs where researchers can present key findings of their studies and solicit comments from various stakeholders. We are joined this morning by participants around the Philippines and APIC region through Zoom and Facebook Live as we try to answer the following questions during the two uh, sessions of the symposium. One, how has the Philippines responded to the sea and what are the lessons from its APIC neighbors? And two, what are the local experiences and projects in the Philippines in transitioning towards a CE? And three, uh, what are the positive pathways towards CE advancement in the Philippines and in the APIC? The first session will uh, focus on the national experiences while the second session will tackle on the uh, regional perspective. Before I end my remarks, let me take this opportunity to thank the Foreign Service Institute Department of Foreign Affairs for co-organizing this very timely and relevant symposium headed by Ambassador Carino and uh, uh, with uh, Ms. Joaquin and Mr. Katigbak, Ms. Bulabos and others. Also, the PIDS PACN team composed of Dr. Kimba, Ms. Carlos, uh, and with the help of the team of Dr. Siar, uh, Ms. Uh, de la Cruz and Ms. Andrada and Mr. Fernandez. Thank you very much, and I'm looking forward for your fruitful discussion. Abby. Thank you so much, Dr. Urbeta. 
Furthermore, as we ensured that the circular economy will be mainstreamed, we invited a very esteemed official who may share valuable perspectives to start the discussions. Um, Attorney Anne Claire Credo Cabochan, a career government executive, is Assistant Secretary for the Consumer Protection Group at the Department of Trade and Industry. As such, she contributes to the policy and regulatory work undertaken by CPG bureaus, Bureau of Philippine Standards, Fair Trade Enforcement Bureau, Consumer Policy and Advocacy Bureau. She is a strong advocate of good regulatory impact practices and has included the conduct of a regulatory impact assessment as an integral requirement in the crafting of regulations. She continues to build on her experience as director of DTI Bureau of International Trade Relations. The position she occupied prior to her promotion and in which capacity she functioned as ASEAN Senior Economic Official, APEX Senior Official for Trade, and lead Philippine delegate to disputes brought before the World Trade Organization. Assistant Secretary Kabuchan had occasion to lead the DTI Consumer Policy and Advocacy Bureau the Bureau of Philippine Standards, and the Philippine Contractors Accreditation Board, a DTI-attached agency. Assistant Secretary Cabochan passed the licensure exam for certified public accountants in 1986 and has extensive experience in the academe as a professor at Suleiman University, Lyceum of, Lyceum of the Philippines, Aureliana University School of Law, and the Sanbeda University. Without further ado, the virtual floor is yours, Assistant Secretary Kabuchan. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Abigail, for that introduction. Good morning, esteemed speakers and participants to this symposium. Allow me to first and foremost thank the organizers, the Department of Foreign Affairs Foreign Service Institute, led by Ambassador Jose Maria A. Canino and the Philippine Institute of Development Studies, led by Dr. Isidro C. Orbeta, who is also the convener for BSCN, for the invitation to address you today. We live in a world increasingly more aware of environmental degradation and its effect on man's ability to thrive and survive. It is certainly most felt in the Philippines and other economies in the Asia-Pacific region. The Pacific Ocean, after all, can be a friend or a foe, depending on the event. For us in the Philippines, policymakers have realized the importance of resilience, sustainability, and the imperative of leaving no one behind. Thus, the ambition not in 2040, this administration's long-term vision has incorporated all of the 17 United Nations Sustainable Development Goals in its agenda. The Department of Trade and Industry in particular acknowledges the need to transition to a circular economy with the aim to champion a newer system, one that is both regenerative and restorative, where the economic development happens on the back of sustainability. The SDGs remain at the forefront of DTI's priorities in the promotion of a circular economy. In addition, in the department, we understand that sustainability reinforces resilience, given that an, on the average, 26 typhoons visit the Philippines annually, and many times living considerable devastation in its wake. Just this year, the Department of Trade and Industry launched the Sustainability and Resilience Agenda with the following key pillars. Clean energy adoption, circular economy, sustainable supply chains and green materials, business continuity and future food. It is a clear manifestation that we cannot proceed with business as usual. To promote clean energy, the Board of Investments offers incentives for investors of clean energy. It also implemented the Greening 
the Industry Roadmap Initiative with international support from the JNZ. The greening the Industry Roadmap is an offshoot of the project Promotion of Green Economic Development or Project. It aims to integrate green economic development in the industry policies of the Philippines and propel climate smart, environment friendly, and globally competitive industries, particularly in six manufacturing sectors, namely automotive, auto parts, pulp and paper, plastic, housing, and furniture. In cooperation with other government entities, the DTI is tasked to contribute to setting framework conditions and to build up capacities that support a paradigm shift towards an innovation process that results in competitiveness, good environmental performance, climate change resilience, and job creation. In addition, the DTI strives to increase awareness among micro, small, and medium enterprises on sustainability. And it is important to note that in the Philippines, just like other Asia-Pacific um, economies, 99.5% of our enterprises are MSMEs. Just this April, the Center for International Trade and Exposition's missions are cited held its first Sustainability Solutions Exchange, and it was my honor to be part of that activity as a panelist. The SSX trade event and conference encompassed a multi-channel approach to sustainable development, a brand with a global panel, an online platform to connect businesses to vetted sustainable suppliers, both locally and abroad, and support programs that help facilitate and transition to sustainable processes for micro, small, and medium enterprises. For sustainable consumption, which is closest to my heart, let me provide you with some updates. We from the DTI Consumer Protection Group are proud to share that the Philippines led the development of the Sustainable Consumption Tilki, which is funded by the Japan ASEAN Integration Fund and it is already in its finalization process. The toolkit aims to provide guidance to consumer protection authorities in ASEAN in promoting sustainable consumption by looking at best practices and public policies that will support sustainable consumption. The toolkit delves with concepts and principles of sustainable consumption, best practices and approaches to policies tools and instruments used in influencing consumer behavior, among others. And just to highlight that all of us in this virtual room are consumers. Through this project, consumer protection authorities can compare varying approaches and formulate policies to influence consumer behavior. Examples of approaches identified in the toolkit are economic tools such as environmental tax consistent with a polluter pay principle and deposit refund scheme, regulatory tools such as environmental quality standards and restrictions, consumer information tools such as certifications, eco-labels, consumption and lifestyle calculators, life cycle and footprint assessments, and consumer education and information campaigns. New behavioral tools such as choice editing and nudging were also explored. Choice editing is removing bad choices of products from the market by implementing minimal standards of which any product falling below are not allowed in the market. Whereas nudging is guiding consumers' behavior in a desirable direction and this outcome becomes the easiest and most attractive option. We look forward to launching this toolkit this June 2022, when the Philippines will host the 24th ASEAN Consumer Protection Conference. Additionally, the Consumer Protection Group currently has the following initiatives on the table. The development of environmental standards, EM, on environmental management systems, 
After all, the CPG houses the Bureau of Philippine Standards, which is the national standard setting body of the Philippines. The development and promotion of equal labeling in cooperation with the Philippine Center for Environmental Protection and Sustainable Development or PSES. Supporting key legislative proposals such as the regulation of single-use plastic and the institutionalization of the extended producer's responsibility and the creation and broadening of awareness on sustainable consumption. The EMS standards guide organizations and businesses on incorporating environmentally conscious designs in their products. In addition, the CPG also assists in the development of Green Choice Philippines, a voluntary third-party equal labeling program that allows the guidelines set by the International Organization for Standardization, or the IMS. Throughout the years, the CPG has continually initiated projects and campaigns to advocate sustainability. Recently, the CPG partnered with the Plastic Credit Exchange, an organization that implements plastic offsetting and extended producer responsibilities. The group also believes that an informed consumer is an empowered one. And so the CPG strives to create and broaden consumer awareness on sustainable consumption through the Consumer Welfare Month, which is celebrated in October each year, and Consumer Ipapibapa, our weekly radio program that is um, hosted by the DTIC. And of course, we have our regular weekly consumer care webinars. And to capitalize on the youth's high level of interest on sustainability, the DTI forged a partnership with the National Youth Commission and is working with the Department of Education to include topics of sustainability in existing primary and secondary education curriculum. We also work actively in the National Solid Waste Management Commission as the DTI Consumer Protection Group represents the department in the Executive Committee as well as the MBAC. And certainly we have taken active participation in the ongoing public consultations on the phase out of a non-environmentally acceptable products. These are our humble contributions towards the promotion of a circular economy. And the DDI is only one of the agencies working on this issue. A whole of government and a whole of society approach is certainly um, ideal so that we can achieve the re realization of a sustainable and resilient Philippines and collectively a sustainable and resilient world. And to close, I am reminded of two values. Thankfulness. We should be thankful what we for what all the resources that have been provided to us. And if you have that level of gratitude, it should translate in the way that we also consume and we also produce. And thoughtfulness, a mindfulness that our consumption patterns impact on everyone in this world. So with that, I say thank you. And I wish you all a very productive solution. Thank you, Assistant Secretary. Um, she highlighted the importance of resilience, sustainability, and inclusivity, and that economic development should happen in the back of sustainability as sustainability supports resilience. Before we move forward with the first session, may I request all speakers, moderators, um, Assistant Secretary Dr. Urbeta, and organizers to open their video for the virtual photo opportunity. Kindly queue if the okay. photo is being taken. Um, I'll count to three. So one, two, three. One more. One, two, three. Thank you, Abby. Thank you. 
Hence, to start the first session of the symposium, which will, focus on, which will focus on the Philippine perspectives, experiences, and pathways, let me introduce the session moderator. Dr. Sulpicia L. Ponce is a faculty member of the Department of Sociology in MSU Ilagan Institute of Technology. She obtained her PhD in sociology at Xavier University in 2005. She has been involved in a number of research since 1987 about peace and conflict, gender and ethnicity, social impact assessments of wind and hydropower projects in Visayas and Mindanao, to name a few. Dr. Ponce also teaches courses in sustainable development studies and was later appointed as the coordinator of the program. Currently, she is the acting director of the Center for Multidisciplinary Studies of the Institute, which, holds, which hosted the SDS program. Dr. Ponce will introduce the speakers and moderate the open forum. Without further ado, may I call on Dr. Ponce. Dr. Ponce, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you so much, Gail, for the very, very uh, warm introduction. Welcome to session one. The Philippine Perspectives, Experiences, and Pathways. Uh, this morning, we have three very esteemed uh, speakers coming from different institutions in the Philippines. I would like to introduce the first one. Uh, she is a faculty of the Department of Biology and the University of San Carlos. And her interests in research include ecotoxicology pollution studies, and waste. Her recent publications are on the occurrence and potential ecological impacts of micro and macro plastics. Today, her discussion will focus on elucidating the macroplastic loads, types, and distribution of mangrove areas around Cebu Island, Philippines, and its policy implications. Uh, it's my honor to give you Dr. Haler. Thank you so much for that press, um, introduction, Mom. Let me share my screen. Is it working now? Is it on the first page? Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, so thank you so much for that introduction in my presentation as what my Dr. Ponce has already um, emphasized that uh, my presentation about macroplastic load in mangrove areas in Cebu. Um, why plastics? Actually, plastic is um, usually it's a fossil based uh, material that is ubiquitous in our society. And in fact, according to Reed, today's society's reliance on plastic is referred to as the plasticine. We see plastics everywhere. So from packaging, even um, with the onset of the health crisis that we are into, there is also the increase of plastic waste from the medical sector. And of course, it is present in our building construction, in our household supplies. Um, so without question, plastic is a very useful material. But the issue often associated with plastics is its disposal, majority of which usually ends up in the marine in the environment and eventually in the marine environment, because only a very few portion of that is in fact recycled. Um, in terms of studies, sadly, according to Jean Beck et al., there is around eight metric tons of plastic waste that ends up in the marine environment um, annually. And in this report, the Philippines ranks third. On a separate study conducted by May here, um, um, accounting for plastic through river systems, and then again, in this particular study, the Philippines is among the top producers of plastic waste. Another input is coming from fisheries or from sea. So these are usually from fishing gears and that would account for around 0.6 uh, metric tons annually. Okay, so there are already, there are a lot of studies conducted of 
um, plastics in the environment. Although apparently most of these cities are skewed towards the seafloor, the open ocean, the beaches, and of course, there are also other studies accounting for its impact on organisms, but very few studies do account for its presence in the mangrove ecosystem, which in fact, because of the structure of the mangrove ecosystems, it would have the inherent potential to trap plastic waste. Um, specifically in the Philippines, um, there is only one study that has been published so far when it comes to plastic occurrence in the mangrove ecosystems. Thus, it is the focus for our study. So another is that the Philippines, according to Galarpi et al., we do have a disconnect when it comes to research on plastic and at the same time policy implications. And thus, it is the motivation of this study that, of course, we have to associate our findings with its policy implications. So specifically, what we did is that we um, characterized plastic litter in terms of load, type, and size in mangrove ecosystems. So how we did it? These are um, the sites. So Cebu, I think you're familiar with the island of Cebu. We are a very uh, long, um, narrow island. So we have mangroves all over the island, all directions of the island. So we sampled at uh, 14 locations or municipalities with mangroves. And then particularly Cebu is a special place because we are a very dense island and population is one of the attributes often associated with plastic waste. And it is without a doubt based on the Enro report that yes, we do have a plastic problem. So how we did it is that um, we established transects in each of the municipality. Some municipalities we establish only three transects, while some municipalities we establish nine or six transects, depending in fact on the length of the coastline covered by the mangroves. So in the transect, we establish a landward quadrat, middle and a seaward quadrat, and then in each 10 by 10, we had to collect all the plastic within the quadrat, brought it to the laboratory, and we dried it and characterized it according to the UN litter classification code. So, and we also size it. Now, as for the results, um, we were able to establish 220 plots for the whole island of Cebu, and that would cover around 18,978 square meters. We were able to collect a total of 4,501 items, and this would mean that we have around 1.29 um, items or pieces of plastics per meter squared. And that is equivalent to around 18 grams of plastics per meter squared. Um, so although it can actually vary, so it would also, some areas also have around 700, the highest is actually around 706 grams per meter square. That's almost a kilo in just one meter squared of plastic. But if we extrapolate that to the total mangrove cover of Cebu, that would around be 245 to 791 tons of plastic in just in the mangrove ecosystem of Cebu Island. And I hope you could imagine how many trucks 791 tons is. But if we also have to divide it with our population, that's just going to end up with 102 grams per Cebuano. So that's actually small. So if we associate that with our population, but generally our findings would show that yes, the 129 pieces per meter squared is comparable with other studies or such as India and Indonesia, but it is in fact high as compared to other um, studies, which are like, for example, in the Caribbean or in the Middle East. So what could be the factors that would associate for this increase? One of course is the mangrove structure because studies would show that the more dense the mangrove is, the more likely that it will be able to trap plastics. 
And of course, the root structure, the species of the mangroves found in the area, because um, if it has pneumatic force and if it has um, crop roots, it would most likely trap um, plastics as well. But what we found out is that most urban centers, such as Consolacion, Mandawe, Bugo, are in fact, or they do have high plastic load in their mangrove sites. So we associate that this, of course, urban is associated with um, economic activity and population. So we would uh, infer that plastic generation is associated with urbanization and the characteristics associated with urbanization. But what we notice is that there is also a difference in the count and mass and that it does not, not always mean that if it has the highest count, it has always the highest mass, such as in the case of Parkar and Bugo here. Because what we notice is that if the plastics disintegrate, then eventually we would have to count them as several plastics, so that's more count. But when you weigh them together, although because they're small, then they would still mean that they have less weight. So in this effect, we would always, or we would suggest that in studying plastics, there should always be the accounting for two types of plastic currency or the reporting of these two types of plastic currency, which is count and mass. Now, what about the type of plastics that we found in the area? First is that large or a huge proportion of the, pla uh, the plastic type that we found in the mangroves are in fact packaging. This is indeed reflective of our sachet economy. A large proportion of this um, is sachet, and of course, we know that um, private companies usually use sachet as also as a ma marketing strategy because they have to sell or they have to introduce a product in such a way that it is affordable or within the coinage system of the market so that it will be able to penetrate the market. So this scenario really shows that companies are in fact can be game changers on how they would be able to strategize this approach in such a way that they would be able to reduce plastic. Um, they may engage into uh, product substitution perhaps or down gauging, or they will have to implement the extended producer responsibility. But nonetheless, it is a call for companies that they have to essentially reduce their plastic footprint which is also another is plastic bags. Um, the plastic bags that we refer to here are the, the one we locally refer to as labo or the cellophane. So indeed, um, Asians or Filipinos, we have this high reliance to plastic bags and most often they are not um, recycled. And of course, because packaging and plastic, they may eventually disintegrate and then become smaller plastics, hence a majority is also the plastic fragment. These are usually materials that we could no longer associate what they originally made of because they have been broken down into small pieces. Another is we have clothing, socks, and PET bottles. These materials supposedly have the potential to be recycled, especially PET bottles that is in fact bought by junk shops at a specific price. But the fact that they are still abundant in the marine environment indicates that the economic incentive associated with selling PET bottles in junk shop may not actually be um, inviting. So I think we have to look into this. And another also, we have to increase the recycling potential of these materials because it is shown that there is already a technology for the recycling, but one is that we have difficulty in recovery so I think we have to improve in the recovery process. And of course, we have to encourage um, stakeholders to recycle these materials. Studies would show that um, stakeholders who are in fact educated, who are in fact engaged, um, they have social economic engagements, they have higher propensity to do recycling. So we have to capture or we have to um, address this concern as well. And of course, we have sanitary materials. These are made of diapers and napkins. Um, usually these are really considered and in typical process is that in our process is that we dispose this and put this in our landfills. But we have to consider also that other countries has already ventured in converting this into a source of um, 
into a source of energy source. So for example, um, it is converted into or it undergoes um, pyrolysis so that it will be converted as a source of energy. Another is that um, these uh, products, they do have three patterns. Packaging, last, uh, packaging, and of course, your plastic fragments. These are usually highest in the landward side, and they eventually will decrease in number in the seaward side. Other products are equally distributed from landward, middle, and then seaward. And then what you have noticed is that we have noticed is that fishing related items are in fact highest in the seaward side. So what does this pattern suggest? Well, of course, they would show that there is in fact transport of plastic within the mangrove ecosystem and that packaging and then also the plastic fragments may potentially originate from the landward side. And then fishing related items, for instance, can only be potentially coming from the seaward or because we have what you call as ghost nets. In, um, once this material or nets or fishing related items are no longer um, usable, or no longer provide um, the purpose, then they, they're just disposed into the sea. So we have to address this. Our commitment to the international marine pollution should also be um, addressed, or we have to look into that because supposedly we have we should not dispose these items into the sea. But overall, our study would show that yes, indeed, plastic flux is coming from land to the sea, and the other one, um, sea to um, the landward side. Um, one, it is affected by the size of the plastics, plastics with larger surface area, and they have um, can be air filled, they tend to be buoyant, and therefore they can be transported across the, man uh, the mangrove breath. And then, of course, biofouling, which may eventually affect also their or reduce their uh, or increase their rate of sinking. So they will become heavier if there is biofouling. So what are the implications of our study? First of all, we know that we have to do uh, mangrove um, reforestation projects, but we encourage that if we do mangrove reforestations, we go to the field and we do plant um, mangroves. But when going back, we suggest that instead of just leaving our plastic bags where we put our seedlings sometimes, into the mangrove area, but we have to bring it back. And along with that, we also have to pick, pick plastic items along the way before um, in going home. But more importantly, the implications for this study is towards the solid waste management. So clearly we have to improve and look into our solid waste management program. We have to um, check from you know the whole process of the waste stream. But what is very clear is that the government has a role in terms of the implementation, in terms of the enforcement. The private sector has to engage on how to reduce their plastic footprint, but also stakeholders has to engage how we can reduce or improve or reduce littering, improve our recovery rate, and at the same time, improve our recycling um, tendency. Because it is clear that littering is common also in Cebu and the rest of the region. So in conclusion, we say that plastic waste is improperly disposed both in land and sea. And then sadly, the mangrove ecosystem serves as a dump site and this improperly disposed waste. Um, as you see, um, population, and then of course, our high plastic consumption, such as our plastic preference, for example, our sachet, and then also the poor waste management, especially in urban centers, um, attributes, in fact, to the voluminous waste in this mangrove. And obviously, it's not just government, but also a private and public partnership has to be implemented. Um, we have to uh, employ, we have to educate, we have to engage the community. And obviously, we need the infrastructure and the technological solutions, and of course, the policy so that we can improve our plastic waste management.
Thank you very much. So this study is in fact uh, funded by the U UK National Environmental Research Council in partnership with um, University of Bangor and I am from the University of San Carlos. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Palev, for that very, very informative, yet a very alarming situation of plastic waste, not only in Cebu, but elsewhere in the Philippines and in the world. Uh, generally, it, it talks about plastic footprint and what are we going to do through intervention and policy, implementation, monitoring, both at the macro level, especially for the producers and also at the household, household levels, basically those who are the consumers of these plastic products. Thank you so much, Mom. Our next speaker will give us a uh, will give us a topic on circular economy and tourism. She is Ms. Ella Marie Gutierrez, a development consultant and the research manager at the Asian Institute of Management's Dr. Andrew Tan Center for Tourism. She is also a senior consultant at Warwick and Rogers and the sustainable tourism specialist of Masungi Geos Reserve Foundation Incorporated. She completed her MA in Development Policy under, uh, under CAS Scholarship and BE in International Studies, major in European Studies, uh, magna cum laude, in the La Salle University, uh, Philippines. She is also currently taking her doctoral degree in uh, Asia-Pacific Studies under the Ritsumikan Asia-Pacific Studies, Japan. Please help me with, uh, welcome uh, Dr. Uh, Ms. Ella Marie Elalair Gutierrez. You have the floor now, ma'am. Thank you so much for your kind introduction, Dr. Ponce. So while my presentation is being screened, um, again, good morning to our honorable participants and guests who are joining us today in this morning's symposium. It is a pleasure to be part of the esteemed set of panelists of today's event tackling the prospects of circular economy in the Philippines and APEC region. Again, I am Ayla Gutierrez from the Asian Institute of Management, Dr. Andrew L. Tan Center for Tourism. And in the next 15 minutes or so, I will be presenting the topic on circular economy in Philippine tourism. So without further ado, next slide, please. Since the outbreak of the pandemic, many of us have become aware of the negative impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic to industries across the globe, and tourism was not an exception. As suggested by several studies and researchers, the pandemic exposed tourism as an already sick industry played with crisis and tensions that have historically existed. And while the COVID-19 pandemic is challenging long-established economic constructs, it also presents a rare opportunity for us to change the economic software of the industry by providing stakeholders like you and me who are here today, a time and a chance to rethink and reimagine how tourism is operated. Ideally, when I say reimagine, I would mean that we use our creative juices or rack our brains to rethink how we would like tourism industries to operate as it should Part and parcel of reimagining or rethinking is the acceptance and recognition of the destructive, if not violent, dimensions of travel and tourism as a means of capitalist accumulation, from issues of social injustices to environmental degradation, among others. Most importantly, this process requires an acknowledgement that something must be changed in the way we do things. Maybe it's time for us to rethink or ask ourselves some questions such as how can one mitigate tourism's adverse environmental and social impacts? Or maybe how can we ensure the industry's overall resilience? And what kind of future do we want tourism to have? And to build back better, a new thinking, a new framing of tourism activities is actually needed. And I argue in this presentation that a shift to sustainable circular economy in the industry should be placed at the forefront of developing the industry for the new normal. Next slide, please.
So for this session, I'd like to propose the idea that in reimagining and rethinking what Philippine tourism can look like in the post-pandemic or in the new normal, the concept of circular economy is to be understood as a critical component. And with this, I intend to answer four things in this presentation. Just to echo um, Dr. Orbeta a while ago, I'll be presenting um, what circular economy is, what the principles of CE means, and what CE or what the principles of CE and how it can be applied to the uh, tourism in Philippine, tourism and hospitality industry in the Philippines. And of course, finally, what needs to be done? What can we do as stakeholders in the industry? So next slide, please. First, let's talk about circular economy. What is it really? So as discussed briefly by our lead convener, Dr. Orbeta, as opposed to a linear economy that assumes a take, make, and waste pattern of production and consumption, circular economy, or CE, is also known as closing the life cycle system, wherein we reconsider waste as a new resource that can be reused in the system. It is considered as a sustainability concept with the goal of increasing the value of products and resources. So for example, water and energy, so that it can stay and be used in the economy as long as possible, thereby reducing waste generation. Emphasized by CE is the restorative and regenerative principles for production, distribution, and consumption. And maybe as you can imagine, this implies a radical change in the current production system and consequently in the way of doing of companies, policymakers, legislators, and even to us as private citizens. Next slide, please. And to expound this concept further, let's talk about some basic principles that also are applied in tourism. First is design out waste and pollution. Next, please. Emphasized by this principle is the idea that waste and pollution is a consequence of our decisions and activities. And as mentioned and emphasized by Dr. Paler a while ago, it is actually our decisions, our basic daily decisions, whether to bring a paper bag or rely on plastic grocery bags or to bring our own water bottles versus buying plastic water bo bottles. These are basically daily decisions that affect the entire system. Next is keep products and materials in use. It's basically the concept of using things versus using them up. So it asks the questions, are we using this resource or just wasting it? Like for example, do we need to keep the water running when we're brushing our teeth or do we throw out our scratch papers or can we use or can we reuse them for some other purposes? And finally, the last principle of regenerating natural systems, which highlights the idea that there is no such thing as waste. Everything is a food for something else. So for example, a dead leaf that fell off a tree can be used by other insects and animals. And again, as mentioned a while ago, plastic containers being used for bricks, for houses, or cooking oils recycled to power up vehicles. So these basic principles, you might be wondering, um, these might be a bit too complex yet simple at the same time, but you might be wondering how is this or how can this be applied to tourism? Next slide, please. So as far as circular, this, uh, circular economy discourse is concerned, it has been predominantly focused on production industries or production manufacturing, while very little discussion has been made on service-dominated industries such as tourism. Um, and of course, very little also has been discussed about the role of travel and tourism in the transition to circular economy. So the, the reality is that tourism is deeply interlinked and dependent on multiple key resource flows, assets, and commodity value chains in society, from agriculture to food, to the built environment, to transport industries, among others. And in fact, tourism as a sector is a huge consumption, is, a, is where huge consumption of energy, water, and food waste, congestion problems, and CO2 emissions take place. 
So shown, shown in the slide is actually just a bird's eye view perspective of the environmental hotspots of hotel, restaurants, and mice industries. So just imagine uh, having a quick glance at this um, from the source of electricity, production of food and souvenir, among others. It just goes to show that um, hotels, restaurants, and mice already consume a lot of um, environmental products. But this is more complex in reality because this just goes to show that each tourism industry sectors and actors exhibit differences in the type and intensity of asset and material use. I mean, just imagine if we look at the experience of or the value chain of um, transport services such as aircrafts, ferries, boats, um, that would be very much different from the needs, for example, of hotels um, and restaurants or, or with the small time tour operators, right? So again, it's a complex scenario when we talk about tourism per se. And in practice, circular economy transformation pathways will definitely differ between sectors and market contexts. So how do we go about this seemingly intricate, intricate endeavor? Next slide, please. Now, because tourism is dubbed as a complex and fragmented industry, next please, that is simply interlinked with and dependent on multiple value chains in society from agriculture to transport industries, it is definitely hard to identify where the natural resources are extracted from and where they end up in. So I propose here on the right side, another perspective that is by looking at not just in a value chain, but also looking at the core product of tourism and hospitality, which is about designing experiences. Thus, the circular economy model can be incorporated through designing a sustainable and circular experiences that goes beyond the sensory or material-based products, but also instead satisfies the effective cognitive, behavioral, and relationship components. Um, and here, the transformational potential of tourism rests, of course, on the significance of immaterial experiences and socially engaging encounters between hosts and guests. So um, you might be thinking right now, how do we actually apply this in actual businesses or how does this actually operate in day-to-day in, um, in -day life? So in the next few slides, I will be sharing with you some cases that, um, that exhibits how circular economy can actually be applied or practiced in tourism. Next slide, please. So the first case is that of the Masumi G Reserve, an internationally awarded privately managed conservation area known for its sustainable conservation effort and innovative geotourism practices. Next, please. Masumi G Reserve is actually located in Baras Rizal, whose beginning can be traced from uh, beginning in 1996. Um, through a public-private restoration project signed to restore a total of 400 hectares of landscapes in the area. And it is only in 2016 that Masumi opened itself to the public for geotourism purposes. And for years now, uh, Masumi offers low-volume trail experiences while supporting local communities surrounding the area. So since its public opening, Masumi... Um, followed a low impact and high value approach that integrates mindful engineering. That means if we take a closer look at the photo, I'm sorry if it's a bit too small. Uh, if you look at the web or the sapot, the, the web-like um, infrastructure there, you would notice that none of these developments, such as these, interfere with the landscape. So none of these web-like structure actually touch the limestones and the trees in the area. And so um, apart from be, for, of imposing mindful engineering, they also made sure that policy enforcement with guests are very much upheld, wherein guests are not only um, asked to follow rules, but are also educated on how they can practice um, conservation um, in their own daily lives. So here in the case of Masumi, circular economy is adapted by ensuring that tourism operations in the area 
facilitate environmental conservation wherein visitors again are educated and local produced are local producer offered to guests and where local community members are employed as park rangers or trail guides and they themselves could talk about the um, the local flora and fauna found in the area as well as the local culture and traditions that are showcased um, along the trails and attesting to the efforts of Masumi in, um, in, in incorporating circular economy in their daily activities, um, Masumi now hosts about 400 or more than 400 species of wildlife, many of which are rare and endemic to the Philippines. So next, please. Now let's look at another case, this time of a resort. Um, let's look at the case of the Luyon Beach and Mountain Resort located in Puerto Princesa, Palawan. Um, the Luyon is actually a multi-awarded resort dubbed as one of the leaders or pioneers in the green movement taking place in the tourism and hospitality sector in the country. Next, please. So it, whenever I talk about the Luyon, it actually represents us to me. It, it appears as an epitome of the circular economy, as the entire um, resort complex actually functions primarily by using green technologies, such as water saving equipment and energy saving measures. So the movement um, the, of the Luyon is actually towards sustainability and is guided by the principles of three R's, um, by the zero carbon resorts project. So the three R's are um, include replacing inefficient appliances and equipment, reducing energy consumption, and redesigning buildings into more self-sufficient and carbon neutral structures. And part of their efforts, again, if you could look at the photos, is, for example, using indigenous and biodegradable products, for example, cooking oil. These are used cooking oils that are used as tea candles, and they also use solar panels, and they also provide tokens like these cookies for guests who are practicing um, environment conscious decisions throughout their stay. And through these efforts, the resort was able to reduce its greenhouse emissions, water and electricity consumption, amounting to a reduction of approximately 40% of the resort's total running costs. So again, that just goes to show that circular economy can actually does not only make environmental sense, but it also make economic sense as well. And finally, for my last um, example, would be um, the case of El Nido Resorts. Uh, El Nido Resorts, if you're familiar with it, is a group of sustainable island resorts found in El Nido and in Taitai municipalities in Palawan, Philippines, and is currently operated by the 10 Knots Group. Next slide, please. So just like um, the two cases that I have shown, um, El Nido Resorts, or ENR, is actually a brand that focuses on sustainability and resilience through what they call a quadruple bottom line strategy that um, the company employs to advocate responsible tourism, um, not only to the tourists or guests, but also to their staff as well. So just like Masumi, um, ENR also values education and training wherein they engage not only visitors, but also their staff in their conservation efforts. So in one of their initiatives, they call it the Be Green. So green stands for Guard, Respect, Educate, El Nido. So this is a set of training seminars for uh, resort staff, wherein they cover topics from ecological solid waste management, water conservation, down to environmental legislation. And this kind of training and education initiatives have also been extended to its community, the local community surrounding El Nido, wherein they also provide training programs to public schools um, to host students, uh, local boatmen, security personnel, fishermen, LGU personnel, among others. And of course, the same efforts of education are also applied to visitors um, by not only engaging them in low impact and sustainable guest experiences, but as you can see, um, the local tour guides could also educate the visitors of what the flora and fauna is in the area. 
And finally, um, part and parcel of ENR's effort to recognize the value of research, such as what Dr. Paler has been doing, um, ENR has also been active in supporting scientific studies that enhance the knowledge about the flora and fauna in the area. So next slide, please. So to summarize these three cases, um, the cases that have I have shared with you are just actually a few of the many unexplored examples illustrating how circular economy can actually be embedded in the tourism and hospitality operation. And what all these three business model types shown us is that um, they have a common ground, and that is the potential to help drive significantly higher research productivity than alternative linear concept models. And other underpinning this movement um, that was showed in the three cases is the shift to a circular economy that is underpinned by the concept of sustainable tourism or sustainability, which is about regenerating and balancing um, between natural, cultural, and human capitals. And finally, to conclude for my final slide, um, how do we go about this? How do we transition to from a linear to a circular economy? So in reality, um, it is important for us who are here today to acknowledge that the transition to circular economy in the country is a long and maybe an arduous process because of the many social, cultural, political, and economic barriers that are existing. However, despite these barriers, um, several seeds could actually be planted to spearhead this transition. First, um, as mentioned a while ago, again, by Dr. Paler, and I think would be echoed later on by our next speaker, one of the prerequisites for circular economy and sustainable tourism in the Philippines is actually a legislative and a policy backbone that addresses environmental and social issues relating to tourism. Um, and I would dare say that this just this needs to go beyond the national level, but also must extend at the regional level as well. Um, and this is especially necessary, such policies are necessary in areas specifically where communities are heavily dependent on natural assets such as um, tourism, fishing, agriculture, among others. So part and parcel of creating this uh, policy support is, of course, a coherent and effective waste management facilities um, and other policies that could influence industry operations. Second, I'd like to point out um, the value of mainstreaming what we call zero carbon enterprises. Again, as mentioned a while ago, the Luyon is already part of the zero carbon resource projects. But then again, um, these could be further expounded to other enterprises. Um, instead of looking at zero carbon enterprises and, as an exception, maybe we could take steps to make this um, mainstream. So maybe um, a push towards sustainable tourism could start by introducing or reducing the consumption of sea, uh, reducing consumption, resource consumption, and of course, um, curbing CO2 emissions and decreasing dependence on other natural resources. And of course, to realize this, government agencies should advocate the use of renewable energy, for example, in small-time businesses and even to larger establishments such as resorts. And third, similar to my second point, um, I do believe that how tourism in the country is branded remains a very critical aspect to transition, um, to transitioning. For example, tourism branding actually needs to raise its pitch explicitly to carry key messages of responsible tourism to increase tourists' consciousness of their behavior toward the environment and people. And um, as I've discussed in my first few slides, and of course, as emphasized already by Dr. Paler again, um, circular economy acts as a daily compass for us, actually. It's a compass that guides our daily decision making, whether to repair, reuse, or renovate a certain item, whether we purchase something. Um, again, this kind of model or thinking, thinking could actually be extended to the choices made by the tourists or visitors like you and me. And finally, again, as emphasized a while ago, stakeholder engagement, and as shown also in the three cases, is very important in transitioning to circular economy. Because at the end of the day, um, this transition actually boils down to engaging and educating stakeholders. 
in 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 this sense, um, it is important for us to also um, foster public private um, tourism stakeholder collaborations that also cuts across industry. So meaning cross industry co coalitions are also important in this case. And um, that integrates tourism as the core economic development lever, not only for um, providing or um, contributing to economic progress, but also in um, facilitating circular economy strategies. And to this end, um, I would like to emphasize that a need for a new tourism thinking in, um, in the industry is obviously necessary. And, and, and the circular economy model actually offers a compelling and new paradigm and a set of tools that could actually assist stakeholders in achieving an innovative, balanced, and resilient tourism industry. And I hope that through this brief discussion, uh, I hope I'm in time, um, I have illustrated how tourism industries um, can not only contribute to, um, to, the, to the transition to circular economy, but can also act as powerful enablers of the circular economy. And that ends my presentation. Thank you and maraming salamat. Thank you so much, Mom, for that very, very informative uh, topic on circular economy and tourism that actually reminds us the three pillars of sustainable development, which is social, uh, uh, calling for governance, especially on policies and other forms of engagement by people, and also environmental aspect, which uh, falls upon uh, the regeneration of the environment while we employ tourism industries. And at the same time, the economic consideration that there should also be profit without sacrificing the environment. Thank you so much. Our next speaker uh, is Mr. Roberto Katigba, a foreign affairs research specialist at the Center for International Relations and Strategic Studies of the Philippine Foreign Service Institute. He undertakes policy-oriented research and analysis on trade and development-related matters under the International Trade and Economic uh, Section. He is also well-published and well-traveled, uh, uh, having participated in a number of national and international conferences. As for, as for his education, he is a master's degree holder in development policy from De La Salle University, uh, and in her undergrad, she also graduated magna cum laude in the Consular and Diplomatic Affairs Program of De La Salle College of St. Daniel. And uh, right now, she's a part -time, he's a part-time faculty member of De La Salle University, Manila, and in Far Eastern University under International Studies Department. To give us uh, a topic on very, very related to his field, uh, he would be delivering to us circular economy related legal and policy frameworks in the Philippines. And I would give the floor to Mr. Huito Katigba. Thank you very much, Dr. Ponce, for the kind introduction. Uh, I hope you can hear me. While the, while the presentation is being set up, allow me to thank, first and foremost, uh, the Philippines Institute for Development Studies, specifically the PASCN, led by Dr. Kimba, and of course, uh, who has done most of the legwork, which is Jean Carlos. No, uh, she po yung nag email sa inyo at ng message, and she's also in charge of collating everything. So thank you very much. Uh, Jean, do you have my slides, or do I need to share my? Okay, sige. Uh, allow me to share my PDF file. And while I'm sharing this, no, uh, before I proceed, before I continue, let me just emphasize that the views and opinions okay, expressed in the presentation do not represent the, the official position of my uh, employer, especially during the open forum. Okay, so can you see my screen? Um, not yet, Tong. I could share the screen. Can you hold on? I'm there. It's flashing now. Okay. Can you see it now? Yes. 
Okay, let me proceed. No? This is basically the outline of my presentation. I just divided the uh, presentation into three parts. Basically, uh, I'll start with characterizing the circular economy. What really is the circular economy? Is it an entirely new concept? Or is it an old concept that has been rehashed no? and that has been made sexier because of the current environment and the landscape that we are in? Second this, I'm going to look at the Philippine laws and policies related to circular economy. Please note that this is not very exhaustive and I just put in here the relevant laws and frameworks according to the uh, table that I prepared. So I identified six major policy interventions okay, that may be implemented or that, that are being implemented by the government along with its partner uh, actors. And the last is I'm going to highlight considerations towards a national framework. I think it was mentioned in the uh, welcome remarks of Dr. Urbeta that there is a need to have a national framework for the Philippines. Our peers, China, Japan, South Korea, Malaysia, and even Indonesia, I think, have indeed launched their own policy or blueprint or framework regarding the circular economy. And the importance of it will be highlighted in the succeeding sessions. So let me proceed to the first part, which is about the circular economy. What really is the concept that drives circular economy? Well, as early as 1960s, okay, circular economy has been floated within the uh, scholarly circles, but it was only until 1980s, 1990s, and up until now that it was consolidated and renamed into what we know today as circular economy. The foundations of the circular economy draw from the work of Stahel and Rede, as well as uh, Pierce and Turner. On the left side of your screen, okay, you can see here the uh, representation by Stahel and Rede that talks about or that focuses on the loop system. And the idea is to basically take advantage of the loops Okay, insert into it several practices that would extend the life of products instead of producing new goods. So the idea here is that the loop system minimizes matter, energy flow, and environmental deterioration without, of course, restricting economic growth and social or social and technical progress. So as early as 1980s, this is the sustainable development principle or the three P's, people, planet, and profit. And as I mentioned, it's basically taking advantage of the different loops. Okay, On the right side, you have here the circular economic system. This takes more of an economic approach by Pierce and Turner. And the again, the general notion here is that as you go along the input throughput, the production process, the byproducts or the wastes can be used as materials for recycling. And then it will be going back to the first stage, which is during the resources, it will become resources for another type of production of, of certain goods. And the underlying assumption here is that Earth is a closed economic system. It's not open, it's not linear, it's a closed economic system that is very much circular in nature. Everything is an input to everything else. Okay? Uh, it's also important to note here that in figure two, the environment uh, waste sink is not always empty. There are always, or there are most often than not, no, there are times wherein certain wastes cannot be recycled or cannot be reused. So environmental waste is not always empty. If you combine these two, one of the uh, most famous representation of the circular economy and the most updated relevant one would be the one uh, prepared by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, which is known as one of the advocates or champions of the circular economy. And the EMF prepared a butterfly diagram, no? which basically represents two cycles put together. On the right side, you have there the technical cycle, wherein it's all, it's the same idea with the previous figures that I shared with you. You take the waste, 
you reuse it, you remanufacture it, you refurbish it, and then you're going to produce another set of products. And then the process becomes circular in nature. On the left side, you have here the biological cycle, wherein the nutrients from biodegradable materials are returned to earth through different processes, no? mainly composting and anaerobic, anaerobic digestion. Anaerobic digestion is basically the processes by which microorganisms break down biodegradable materials without oxygen. So think of biogas. Next slide, please. Now, if you try to define, I'm sorry, if you try to define what circular economy is, there are different definitions. No? And it depends on the interpretations of countries and their positions on what circular economy really is. Because as I've uh, mentioned, circular economy has been associated with different concepts. It has been associated with sustainability, with sustainable development, sustainable development goals, and a lot of several concepts. Okay? Uh, the more known definitions of the circular economy are one that uh, are, are those that are provided by the Ellen MacArthur Foundation and by Kircher. This is uh, these are the comprehensive ones, and I uh, elected to put this in the presentation because I wanted to encapsulate what really is a circular economy. And a circular economy is an industrial system that is restorative and regenerative by intention and design, and it replaces the end-of-life concept with restoration, shifts towards the use of renewable energy, eliminates the use of toxic chemicals, which impair reuse, and aims for the elimination of waste through the superior design of materials, products, systems, and within this, business models. The other definition is provided by Kircher and the others, which describes circular economy as an economic system that is based on the business models which replace the end-of-life concept with reducing or alternatively reusing, recycling, and recovering materials in production or distribution and consumption processes. So idea, the idea here is that everything flows through a circular process as uh, compared to the linear process, which, were ex which was explained by the previous presenter. In the Philippines, how do we define then circular economy? Well, the House Bill 7609, filed by uh, then Congresswoman Lauren Ligarda, defined circular economy as basically a system approach wherein products are designed for durability, reuse, and recyclability and materials for new products uh, come from old products. It minimizes waste and maximizes the use of natural resources. The document is available online and they also define certain terms that are very relevant to circular economy like assimilative capacity and other related terms. If you try to look at what are the general benefits of the circular economy, well, some of them have been discussed no, by the previous presenters, but just to, for the sake of uh, reiterating them, number one is, of course, it would transform the current linear economy and it would eliminate waste, reduce pollution, and promote sustainable development. It may also address climate change and biodiversity loss, and it would separate the ability to achieve economic growth from the consumption of natural resources. So it's ideally decoupling of economic growth from the rapid consumption and intensive consumption of natural resources. It might also create jobs, but of course, there are also jobs that are threatened because of the circular economy. So these are the general benefits when we talk about circular economy. Now, what are the drivers and barriers? Generally speaking, no, uh, an analysis done by Govindan and Asag Janich looked at what are the cluster of drivers or barriers related or impeding or promoting circular economy. And they identified a number of barriers and drivers alike. For the barriers, they determined that governmental issues, economic, technological, and knowledge and skills issues, as well as management issues, are very much those that impede the mainstreaming of circular economy. It's also important to note that the lack of successful business model, as well as the lack of national framework on circular economy, hinder the 
effective adoption of circular economy practices and principles. There are also resistance and lack of awareness about the circular economy as well as several market issues, legal problems and lack of standards in variable quality of refurbished products, which I believe, as Kabuchan has mentioned, that the DTI, along with other agencies, have been trying to come up with national standards related to uh, goods uh, associated with the circular economy. As for the drivers, these include policy and economy, basically government laws and policies, which compel firms to act, as well as public and animal health, which are basically compromised by, by the pollution problem. So, and these remain as important actors as well as uh, stakeholders in the fight against reducing waste or the fight against waste. Okay? Another driver would be policies relating to environmental protection and the increasing urbanization and adoption of sustainable principles by the society. And the last is, of course, product development. No? How far, how advanced are the supply chains in terms of coming up with circular economy products or products that have high recycled material content? The second part now moves to the laws and policies in the Philippines on circular economy. And the Ellen MacArthur Foundation, again, identified six types of policy intervention. And just to uh, enumerate them, first one would include, of course, education, information, and awareness, basically advocacy, raising awareness amongst stakeholders and the targeted audience. The second one is collaboration framework. And I think you know, in, in the group chat and in the presentations before me, they have emphasize and underscore the importance of partnerships between public sector, private sector, and even the participation of civil society organizations. The third one talks about business support schemes, and the fourth one is about public procurement and infrastructure. The last two policy intervention times are very important, and this is these usually are the areas where government substantially come, comes in. Okay, these are regulatory frameworks as well as fiscal frameworks. Now, using this table, I tried to, you know, I attempted to list all of the related laws and policies in the Philippines. But before I proceed with that, this is just to show you, you know, the Philippine Action Plan for Sustainable Consumption and Production. As you can see here, this is prepared by NEDA. The vision is basically to have a present and future generation that have Amatatag, maginhawa, and panatag na buhay. You can see here also the goal is for more Filipinos to produce and consume green goods and services to accelerate the shift towards sustainable and climate smart practices and lifestyle. And what are the action nodes? Same, almost the same as the previous slides that I showed. Previous slide that I showed you, uh, policy interventions interventions may come in areas such as policy and regulation innovation and technology and research and development, infrastructure and promotion and education. Now, as to the specific policies and programs on circular economy in the Philippine setting, I prepared the table, but I have to give a caveat here that this is not exhaustive. No? Uh, I, the paper is still in development, I'm still writing it, it's still in progress, so expect the list to be expanded. But for the purpose of our discussion and my presentation uh, during the session, these are the very relevant and very mainstream programs and policies that can be accessed online and as well as the progress of these or the outcomes of these projects. As for the education information awareness, as you can see here, no, the main actor or stakeholder would be an NGO, which is the Philippine Center for Environmental Protection and Sustainable Development, which have launched projects such as the Sustainable Diner Project, the National Eco-Labeling Program, the Calicasan GP3, which is a biennial advocacy uh, meetings. No, it is, again, 
being uh, organized by the National Ecolabeling Program, which is convened by the PCEPSDI, okay? and the Philippine Green Pages. All of these initiatives contribute to raising awareness and information, and of course, educating the public and targeted actors about what circular economy is, about circular economy. Okay? There's also, we can also see now that life cycle analysis courses are being integrated into the curricula of several schools. Example would be De La Salle University. In terms of collaboration platforms, it's also, again, it's important to highlight that advancing circular economy will not be achieved if the government is the only actor. No? I'm, the operative term is only. Part partnerships and synergies must be built between not only the government, but also between non-governmental organizations, no? development organizations, private sector, and of course, public sector agencies. What are the examples of collaborative activities under the circular economy? You have here the Ecotown Scale-Up Project between launched by the Global Green Growth Institute in partnership with the Philippine Climate Change Commission. You also have the promotion of green business practices among micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises in food processing industry, and the Philippine Alliance for Recycling and Material Sustainabilities Zero Waste to Nature Ambition 2030. Private sectors also participated in the circular economy efforts you know, through the EcoBrick eco projects by Shell and Ayala Land Incorporated. On matters of business support schemes, Mother Earth Foundations have been training plenty of small and medium-sized enterprises in terms of practices and principles related to the circular economy. I think it was also discussed the Zero Carbon Resorts Project of EU Switch Asia Program uh, as uh, exemplified in the Daluyon Resort. And of course, Land Bank has launched its Carbon Finance Support Facility, which finances several projects related to, uh, I think it's the transformation of several materials into re, re, uh, waste into reusable inputs to production. In terms of public procurement infrastructure, the Philippines have recently crafted, has recently crafted its Philippine Green Public Procurement Roadmap, which advances uh, the general procurement until 2022 and beyond, and it draws on the laws related to our uh, procurement, no? especially the recent one which modernizes the procurement process in the Philippines. As for the fiscal frameworks, the Philippine Green Jobs Act of 2016 provides tax incentives as high as 50% to businesses or companies or enterprises engaging in the use of uh, green materials, okay, uh, green initiatives, and of course, hiring people that are to be engaged in the green industry or green jobs. As for the regulatory frameworks, these are the major uh, policies and laws that relate to circular economy. Of course, foremost of which is the Ecological Solid Waste Management Act of 2000, which is still a large problem in the Philippines. As of 2017 or 2016, if I'm not mistaken, only 51% have submitted their 10-year waste management plan, uh, meaning the local government units. And in 2017, uh, the waste you know, uh, that is being produced by the Philippines on a daily basis has increased. So much work is to be done in terms of the ecological solid waste, solid waste management of 2000. Okay? Other important laws and policies include the Toxic Substances in Hazardous and Nuclear Waste Control Act of 1990. And one of the challenges here would be the e-waste or the electronic waste, which refer to the discarded electronic or electronic products no, such as used cell phones, uh, television sets, and so on and so forth. I think uh, DNR has launched its guidelines on the implementation of the management of the e-waste. Okay. So I, at least there's some progress in terms of the managing of e-waste, which has become, which has increased because of the spending of Filipinos on these types of digital technologies and electronic products. Other related laws and policies 
are the Philippine Environment Code of 1977, the Philippine Clean Air Act of 1999, the Organic Agriculture Act of 2010, of course, the Renewable Energy Act of 2008, which provides a feed-in tariff scheme for those who would like to invest in renewable energy, the Public Utility Vehicle Modernization Program of the DOT, and there are certain drafts that are being prepared by the different agencies, such as the National Plan of Action, Marine Litter, Philippine National Plan for Sustainable Consumption and Production, and Sustainable Science and Technology for Solid Waste Management Roadmap. There are also several local ordinances in several government units that tackle circular economy in piecemeal ways. In terms of the proposed measures in Philippine Congress from 2010 to 2021, you can see here that majority of the bills focus on uh, plastics and waste and waste management. No? Uh, only two relate to circular economy, and one of which is House Bill 7609, which is authored by Senator, I'm um, sorry, Congresswoman Lauren Legarda, the incoming senator. Okay? And uh, if you look at the Senate, there's no circular economy bill or, or proposed measure. So again, many of the proposed measures and the existing measures address circular economy in a very specific way, mainly through the use of plastics and waste and waste management. And this is because majority of the uh, waste that we produce are, of course, plastics. And the challenges that we face relate to waste and waste management, specifically the lack of uh, recovery facilities in many LGUs. And again, the absence of 10-year management uh, waste management plans. This is the most recent table, and this is taken from uh, the paper of Bueta. It looks at the impending proposed measures on in the Philippine, 18 Philippine Congress from 2019 to present. Again, the specifics would relate to plastics and waste management, and there's also a zero plastics in tourism act of 2019. Uh, not included here is the House Bill 7609, which is the uh, Philippine Circular Economy Act, which we will discuss in a while. Bueta also underscored very important points related to the country's legal and policy frameworks. Number one is that the current laws and policies underline the need to push for more specifically uh, for for specific circular economy policies and regulations no? uh, circular economy is much more comprehensive than plastic and waste and waste management but of course it is understandable that one of the challenges in making policies and in successfully lobbying policies is that or successfully translating uh, agenda into policy is the strength of the lobby group, their access to the policy makers, and of course, the relevance of the issue. Okay, And this is related to the third uh, point made by Bueta, which is that many of the proposals tend to be reactive okay, and their flavor of the times. Whatever is mainstream and what something that is being talked about in media and in policy circles, then policy would pick up. Okay? In terms of the policies that I shared with you in legal frameworks, many of them can be described as piecemeal and ad hoc, ad -hoc approaches. Okay? And another problem is that we have, many, we have policies, but there's lack of follow-through on proposals and lack of effective implementation. So these are some of the observations made by Bueta. Now, taking into consideration the policy frameworks, the observations, what's the way forward? No? The way forward is basically, and, and, and the answer is, uh, or the, risk, the policy option is blatantly out there. No? And it's, it wouldn't take that much extensive research no? to note that we do not have still we do not still have a circular economy national framework. Okay? The importance of a circular national economy framework is basically to harmonize 
all of these piecemeal ad hoc approaches and to set a national uh, set a national guidance and to set a national direction in terms of what is actually the direction of the country relating to circular economy. Of course, the House Bill 7609 is a welcome development, but it is yet to be made into a law. And so much work is to be done. In terms of considerations for creating a national framework, what are the important points that experts, policymakers, and members of epistemic communities uh, may examine? Number one is, based from the example of China, which is a best practice, no? as early as 2008, they had the circular economy law. Okay? They have mainstream circular economy across different levels simultaneously. Micro, meso, and macro. When you talk of micro level, you talk of organizational level, no? households and firms, uh, mainstreaming circular economy. Meso, the creation of eco-industrial parks or industrial symbiosis. Basically, the idea is that the waste or the byproducts of one company can be used by others in, in a similar or related industry as inputs for their production. So this is the idea behind industrial symbiosis. I think there was a study that looked at industrial symbiosis in Laguna, in an industrial park. But the finding is that there's lack of awareness about what is industrial symbiosis and lack of impetus and momentum to do such. At the macro level, we're talking here of city and regional ordinances and policies enacted by the Chinese government. And the way that they approach this is through the principle of experimentation under hierarchy. It essentially means that several programs are tailored based on the need of a certain locality or city or organization or industrial park. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. It depends on the need of a local, uh, of a locality or a city. And what's, uh, what anchors this experimentation under hierarchy model is the presence of incentives okay, to the, uh, to the uh, cities, to the firms, to the regions that perform well. No? Incentives are made available. Another uh, important note that we have to incorporate in the national framework is to identify what is our, what are our circular economy indicators? How do we ascertain the level and the progress of our circular economy adoption? Okay. Uh, I would like to emphasize that circular economy indicators are not uniform. They're not standardized. Okay? Uh, depending on the conditions, depending on the interpretations, depending on the policy orientation of a country, circular economy indicators may be modified or may be uh, fitted to the orientation of a government or a certain implementing agency. And so the role of the National Natural Capital Accounting or Environment and Natural Resource Accounting and Assessment Plan may play a vital role because they're in charge of coming up with data, methodology for ascertaining our circular economy adaptation. The NCCAP uh, is embedded in the proposed House Bill of Senator, oh, sorry, Congresswoman Lauren Legarda. Another uh, Consideration is that there's a need to develop a circular economy monitoring framework to track the progress of the government in mainstreaming principles and practices related to circular economy. So this is somehow related to the second point, which is identifying specific circular economy indicators. The OECD has prepared or has developed its own monitoring framework. And I think the Philippine government may use that as a reference document. Other considerations, and this is my last slide, Okay, is to incorporate smart regulation to nurture partnerships among public sector agencies, businesses, and commercial or non-commercial third parties. Smart regulation is essentially the application of regulatory policies and implementation or enforcement of laws that is uh, that involves government or public sector agencies 
businesses, the ones that are being regulated, and commercial or non-commercial third party. No, the goal here is to ensure that regulation, that the burden of regulation, does not rely solely on the government, and so it basically nurtures synergies and partnerships among the cited agencies. The fourth, I'm sorry, the fifth uh, consideration would be to enforce, no? actively or aggressively enforce the extended producer responsibility policies and the polluter pays principle. Again, it's trying to lessen the burden of the government and, and the consumers in terms of the responsibility on, uh, on uh, wastes management and shifting it towards the producer themselves. Okay, so the extended producer responsibility and the polluter pays principle. This has been this have been proven to work in many circular economy in many countries who have adopted circular economy policies. The sixth one is we need to determine what's the what's the most beneficial time frame for us when we create when we create our national plan. Is it a five year plan? Is it a six year plan? Is it an eight year plan? Is it a ten year plan? So on and so forth. Based on the experience of Malaysia, of China, they would come up with plans that are five year plans. But given the nature of our uh, system, no, we have a six year, every six years, every six years we have elections. So would it be wise to do a, a six year plan or a five year plan or less than a five year plan? Okay. These are some of the considerations that experts and policymakers and decision makers might look into. And of course, the last is there's a need to raise awareness among the public in terms of the basics, the principles, and the policies related to circular economy, especially among micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises and the informal sectors. The use of digital technologies may, of course, benefit, but of course, we have to understand that there's still digital divide that has to be overcome and now the problem of public disinformation. Nevertheless, these are some of the considerations that the Philippine government and other stakeholders may look into as we head towards a circular economy Philippines, hopefully. And with that, I'll end my presentation. Uh, I hope I did not go over time, but at any rate, thank you very much. And I look forward to the questions. Thank you so much, Sir Katibak, for that very exhaustive discussion on the driver's issues, measures, and ways forward the government is doing regarding the Philippine, uh, uh, Philippine aspects on circular economy and all these related uh, concerns. Uh, in the interest of time, we can only accommodate one or two questions, and I would select this these questions from, from the uh, those who actually uh, shoot their comments here. And I would also advise all the presenters to please, uh, to please uh, say something about the question as well. Okay, so one of the questions here has, something to do with which LDUs could be considered as the models of circular economy. Maybe this was mentioned earlier, but actually perhaps the participants missed this one. Uh, there, there, there may be a need to promote these models or to create models. For, at the same way, there would have been model LDUs in terms of problem on malnutrition intervention and local governments. Uh, Will the speaker comment on that? Okay, and they have more questions here. Okay. Uh, and another question is on Mr. Cutting Back. Uh, though it seems that the regulatory frameworks you have cited do not actually move to the big generators, move the big generators of waste to change their ways and to realize the butterfly framework of EMF. 
that you have actually cited, perhaps there needs to be a more detailed and systematic policy frameworks that may be enforced to the big players. Okay. And, uh, and at the same time, there are big, there are, there are big corporations that should also be involved in this, in this particular activity. And, uh, and he's talking about the carbon majors who are using the large part of PSC emissions, just example, but also relevant to CE. Okay, so I think this is being uh, given by Mr. Perla. Uh, in general, I would also request the presenters to say something as a final piece regarding your presentations and how these uh, particular contributions you have this morning would actually elevate to the level of policy, uh, you know, policy framework of, of our government. Uh, along that line, sir, and mom. Okay. Um, Dr. Ponce, if I could give it a shot, the first question on the LGUs that could be yes. considered as models of circular economy. Well, as far as um, my research has been concerned, I think one of the model LGUs that we can cite is that of the Palawan government, at least the provincial government of Palawan, um, mm -hmm. primarily because it's the only, I believe it's the only um, province or LGU that has actually um, its own sustainable development agency. So it's the Palawan, Palawan Council for Sustainable Development. So just imagine how much serious the LGU is for having developed um, such a mandate that actually promotes sustainability across, um, across the province. So maybe um, that could also be explored apart. I mean, just looking at the examples that I have provided from El Nido to uh, El Nido Resorts to um, the Luyon, which are both found in Palawan as well. So yeah, maybe that could be helpful. Okay, thank you, Ma'am. Ma'am Gutierrez. Oh, Ma'am Alep, anything you can say? <laughs> yes, Ma'am, good morning. Um, I can only speak for Cebu, Ma'am, no, because these are the sites that I visited. And um, to be honest, um, in terms of, they are even struggling with waste management as of the moment. So when it comes to circular economy, they're actually very far from achieving circular economy. I have, you know, I have to be blunt about it. So, um, and in fact, this is a concept that we really still have to introduce to them. So I, I think that's it. So it's still, it's still premature to really say where yeah. we are in yeah. terms of circular economy. Yeah, it's a work in progress, really. Sir Katiba, yes. you have an ex extensive discussion on the policy implications and ways forward regarding circular economy. Anything you can add? Thank you very much, Dr. Ponce. I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Gutierrez and Dr. Palerno for sharing their insights. Actually, just to comment on the... Uh, I'll just make it quick no, because I think I took up much of the time. Uh, but just to reply to the comment of Sir Elpidio, no, uh, regarding the shifting the burden towards the large corporations and those that usually uh -huh. uh, emit the largest waste. I, I yeah. think I was able to discuss that in the latter part of my discussion. And I think the enforcement of the polluter pays principle and the extended producer responsibility would be a very welcome uh, policy uh, development in the Philippine setting. I'd also mm -hmm. like to acknowledge the comment made by uh, one of the guess here that the National Plan of Action on Marine yeah. Litter is not a draft anymore. Thank you for that. No, It has been issued on August 5, 2021. So just to end, I just want to underscore that the objective of the symposium is to really bring people together to express their ideas and to come up with takeaways that might be, that may, that will be disseminated to important uh, circles such as PADS, uh, DFA, even to APEC. There's a question here regarding what can APEC do. I think we can uh -huh. save that for later because that is be for session two. But yeah. uh, basically, uh, I just want to highlight that. And I'd like to reiterate the point of uh, ASEC Kabuchan that this is a whole of government and whole of society approach. It will not be achieved overnight and it will not be achieved only by the government. It's a collective effort 
among different stakeholders across different levels and of hopefully nationwide. No? Circular economy might be it's made, it might be a green economy, it might be sustainable development. At the end of the day, the goal is to basically reduce the waste, close the loops, and to, of course, save the environment without prejudicing economic growth and social justice. So I'll end my uh, comment on that. Thank you very much, Dr. Ponce, once again. Okay, thank you so much for the discussions this morning. I'm sorry for actually cutting off some of these questions here, but we can continue uh, discussing with our presenters after even after our symposium today. And uh, thank you so much. And uh, I, I will turn this over to the MC for today for the next part. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Ponce and speakers. Uh, we will have a short health break and we will resume in uh, two minutes. Thank you. Okay, um, welcome back participants. Uh, before we begin, um, maybe kindly ask um, our session two speakers to also turn on their videos for a quick um, virtual photo opportunity. Um, kindly queue if the photo is ready to be taken. Okay. I will be taking your photo in three, two, one. One more. One, two, three. Thank you, Abby. Okay, thank you so much, Jean. Um, so be to start the second session, may I call on the moderator, um, Dr. Francis Mark A. Kimba, who is uh, the lead of the PASCN. Uh, sir, the virtual floor is yours. Uh, 
thank you, Abby, and uh, um, welcome to the second session. Uh, on this session, we have three esteemed speakers from the APEC region. And to start, um, let me now first introduce Dr. Lily Yuwilaichit. Uh, Dr. Lily Yuwilaichit is uh, Vice President of the National Science and Technology Development Agency, and she serves as a member of the World Federal uh, on Culture and Collection Executive Board, an executive board member of the Asian Network on Research Resource uh, Center, ANRRC, and the Secretariat of the ASEAN BCG, or the Biocircular Green Economy. Um, without further ado, let me now call on Dr. Yuvilai Chip. Uh, the floor is yours, ma'am. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. You can keep hear me okay? Yes, ma'am, I can hear you. Thank you very much. So uh, I'm not sure if I have my slide, my colleague will share the slide. Uh, let me check. Um, hello, ma'am, I could share your slide. I'm one of the organizers. Okay, please share the slide for me. Thank you. Uh, actually, okay. Actually, who's here? But okay. So you share the slide for me. Okay, thank you so much. Um, okay, so again, well, it is my great honor to participate in this event. Um, so today I would like to share with you the Thailand's priority agenda on biocircular green economy or BCG model. Um, I'm not sure, like, okay, that's better. Thank you. Um, so it is uh, Thailand's priority agenda uh, now since um, 2020. And um, this has been declared by the government, by the Thai government as a national agenda. So uh, it is the way forward for Thailand on the resilient and sustainable development. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that I will want to mention briefly uh, about that and also about the circular economy in Thailand because it is very relevant to this forum. And also, of course, I want to uh, touch upon the development of BCG in terms of regional collaboration. Thank you. Uh, so next, please. So BCG model comprises of three components, that is bioeconomy, circular economy, and green economy, as shown here. Um, so the bioeconomy will involve the production of renewable bioresources and their conversion into high value products. The circular economy will aim at renewing usage and perpetuating the usefulness of resources. And the green economy um, actually will keep the economic growth, societal and environmental well-being in balance, leading to sustainable development. So each component, of course, is not new and has been applied in many countries as one of the uh, sustainable development approaches. So Thailand combines all three aspects to make sure that our economy will rely on the national strength, uh, which are biodiversity and cultural diversity, while using science, technology, and innovation to raise national competitiveness, strengthen communities, and restore and protect environment. So the BCG economy model pays particular focus on four important sectors in Thailand, and that are food and agriculture, medical and wellness, energy, material, and biochemicals, and tourism and uh, creative economies. Um, next, please. So BCG in, is in line with Thailand's 20-year uh, national strategy, and it certainly enables sustainable development goals, or UN SDGs, to the promotion of sustainable agriculture, uh, clean energy, and responsible consumption and production. Next. So the principle of BCG is to create value from biodiversity, bioresources, and waste. So by using SCI or science, technology, and innovation, higher value of products can be created as shown in these examples. And in, in addition, down there, you can see that BCG also implement circular economy principle that is reuse, refurbish, sharing, recycle, and upcycle, 
and also maximize life cycle usage and importantly emphasize on zero waste policy. Next, please. So here, the five-year BCG action plan sets a vision to create sustainable and quality growth with science, technology, and innovation. The action plan is based on the four strategy. Firstly, to promote sustainability of biological resources. Secondly, to strengthen communities and grassroots economy. Thirdly, uh, to build resilience to global changes. And lastly, to enhance sustainable competitiveness of Thai BCG industry. Next, please. So as the BCG economy model involves all sectors in society, including public, private, academic and research, community and international alliance, a structure and mechanism of BCG economy have to be set in place for administrative as well as monitoring and evaluation. So uh, shown here, you can see that three levels of committees have been set up to oversee the BCG implementation in Thailand. And this consists of the BCG policy board, which is chaired by our prime minister. And then the BCG implementation committee chaired by the minister of Ministry of Higher Education, Science Research and Innovation, or MESI. That is why you hear very often that BCG have to be supported by STI. And of course, 11 BCG subcommittees for each specific sectors as shown in the slide. So National Science and Technology Development Agency or NASDAQ, the, 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 the organization that I affiliated with, has been assigned to be the secretariat of the first two committees and also secretaries of all subcommittees to ensure the seamless operation among all sectors. Next, please. So we expect that the BCG model will make significant impact in four aspects, namely um, sustainability of resources and the environment by reducing natural resource consumption and greenhouse gas emission. Socioeconomic prosperity by improving income inequality, health and quality of life, and energy security. Sustainable economic growth by raising economic value of the BCG industry with high value goods and services and more income to the grassroots. And self-reliance by enhancing skill of our workforce, creating more startup and innovation driven enterprises and improving technological self-reliance. Next, please. So as the meeting is quite relevant to CEs or circular economy, and uh, as the CE is also one of the component of the BCG economy, I would like to briefly mention the current progress on circular economy in Thailand. So like many countries in the world, Thailand is also facing, on one hand, increasing amount of waste and improper waste management, and on the other hand, opportunity for new businesses so called from waste to wealth. And it is also responding to several targets to, of, of SDGs. So that's why uh, Thailand is also heading towards circular economy approaches. Um, next, please. So in general, all BCG action, circular economy included, have driven by the four sectors. A business, government, academy, and community, so-called quadruple helix model. And this is also the reflection of how the several uh, BCG committees I mentioned earlier are structured. And in particular of the circular economy in Thailand, government allocated some budget to be managed by the Thai funding agency or called PMUC, um, Program Management Unit C for competitiveness to support the CE research project. And in addition, as shown in the slide, uh, business and industries working closely with several government agencies to promote CE business, also like economy business, <clears throat> including knowledge sharing and investment incentive from the Board of Investment or BOI of Thailand uh, to cir circular economy-based companies who invested in Thailand. Next, please. So now back to the larger picture, which is BCG. In terms of international collaboration, bio and green economy or BCG has been 
one of the great agenda for international activities. And when we look at ASEAN member states, as shown here, as ASEAN member states already embrace the green and sustainable concepts in their national plans and framework. For example, here, Singapore Green Plan 2030, Malaysia National Green Technology Policy, and of course, Philippines National Climate Change Action, and so on. So next, please. Um, in addition, when we look at the ongoing activity and initiative in ASEAN related to BCG, there are several networks and centers that also work complementarily with the BCG concepts and the more uh, recent established center and activities are, for example, um, uh, below in the two, two below, ASEAN Center for Sustainable Development Study and their dialogue, ACSDSG, and ASEAN Circular Economy Stakeholder Platform under the EU ASEAN Dialogue Instrument or eReady. Next, please. So therefore, we may say that despite being the national agenda, the BCG model shares similar vision to the SDG policy in many countries and regions. For example, the EU Green Deal, Japan Green Growth Strategy, and the US Carbon Neutrality Pledge. Therefore, Thailand is actually looking at establishing international collaboration based on the BCG agenda to underpin the global sustainability. As you may also aware that the host of APEC 2022 or Asia Pacific Economic Cooperation is a Thai top, um, is actually Thailand. And as um, the host of APEC, Thai government is also introducing the BCG model as a tool to address three priority areas for APEC 2022, which are firstly, inclusive and sustainable growth, secondly, trade and investment facilitation to achieve long-term growth and wealth, and thirdly, a restoration of mobility and tourism to recover from the COVID-19 pandemic. And also in the, uh, not yet, sorry. So, and in the ASEAN region, the ASEAN BCG network has recently been set up under the framework of the ASEAN Committee on Science, Technology and Innovation or ASEAN COSTI. Next, please. So the network will be the one of the active platform for exchanging knowledge and experience on the BCG and SDG and enable the capacity building and technology diffusion via workshop and showcases, as well as joint research and chair facility. Next, please. So the, for the activity, uh, we will focus on introducing the BCG concept and set up the platform where we could share and exchange our knowledge and experience to achieve sustainable development goals. The ASEAN BCG platform include website, uh, meeting, and uh, various project activities and events. So the network will also focus on the capacity building and technology sharing via workshop and showcases. The joint research project and chair facility could also be enabled through this network. Uh, so we expect that the ASEAN BCG network will benefit not only just researchers and innovators, but also to the policy uh, makers and also business sectors. Next, please. So since the ASEAN BCG network has, uh, was endorsed in the ASEAN COSTI or ASEAN Committee on Science, Technology and Innovation, um, several activity has been conducted as shown here, uh, including the BCG Knowledge Sharing Forum, the official launch ceremony of ASEAN BCG network and webinar with other ASEAN center who has the complementary uh, agenda, for example, seminar with ACSD SD that I mentioned earlier on the BCG knowledge sharing. Next, please. Here are also upcoming activity on site in Bangkok, Thailand. There are, uh, there are uh, first official BCG meeting um, and also BCG day with pitching on BCG uh, showcases and also BCG, uh, ASEAN BCG researcher development program, which we plan to invite the member of ASEAN, uh, ASEAN BCG network to participate in the program. So if you're interested to learn more about this upcoming activity or about ASEAN BCG network, please contact us for more detail at the, you know, using this QR code here, or you can email us at the 
ASEANBCG at NASDAQ.OR.TH. Next, please. So finally, I would like to emphasize that we are facing several global challenges. So we need global collaboration to resolve them and to create more and more positive impact. So please, um, you know, again, if you're interested to, you know, join us, please, uh, we are, you are very much welcome. And I would be happy to discuss with you later in the, you know, Q&A session. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lili, for a very comprehensive and um, thought-provoking um, uh, presentation. Um, Dr. Lili mentioned the VCG model as an agenda for Thailand and with um, uh, maximizing their strengths of biodiversity and cultural diversity to support uh, four main industries. Uh, Dr. Lili also highlighted the role of uh, science, technology, and innovation in the implementation of the B BCG model. Uh, she mentioned also that uh, uh, as a part of the whole of government approach, they have uh, identified some investment incentives and also supporting uh, the researchers uh, in order to um, implement the, the BCG model. Finally, towards the end, um, Dr. Lili has um, identified two new um, centers in ASEAN the, that would support the, the uh, BCG model. And also she mentioned the ASEAN BCG network that has, that's currently being um, uh, implemented and uh, launched. And um, she called um, the activities would include uh, websites, um, uh, capacity development and even workshops. And she called on a collaborative approach towards the implementation of the BCG network. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Lili, for your uh, presentation. Uh, then we proceed to the next presentation. Where, um, that And this would be uh, presented to us by a researcher from the APEC Policy Support Unit. And the topic will be, don't let waste go to waste. Um, Dr. Um, uh, Ms. Nguyen uh, Su Quinn um, uh, is a, holds a Master's of Arts in International Trade from Sogang Graduate School of International Studies uh, in Korea. Uh, prior to joining APEC, she has worked on a number of development projects on environmental sustainability, supply chain connectivity, and standards in Vietnam and the Southeast Asian region. So Ms. Nguyen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Kimba. Uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for uh, the opportunity to be here. Can everybody see my slides and hear me well? Okay. Um, I would like to make a few remarks uh, before I uh, start with the presentation. Uh, first of all, uh, the uh, presentation is based on two papers published in uh, uh, 2020 by the policy support unit at the APEC Secretariat. Uh, one is the theme chapter of the APEC regional trend analysis in May 2020, uh, named What Goes Around Comes Around, Pivoting to a Circular Economy. And the second paper is the policy brief uh, number 30, uh, published in January 2020, by also by the policy support unit uh, named Circular Economy, Don't Let Waste Go to Waste. And the two, these two papers can be accessible online among other publications by APEC and the policy support on uh, APEC.org under publications. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so uh, previous uh, speakers have touched on waste as well as the, um, the process of our circular economy uh, be it plastic or other types of waste. So this presentation will again attempt to uh, look at the waste crisis and uh, consider the transformation to a circular economy as a response to uh, the growing waste crisis. Uh, it, will, uh, it will present the benefits uh, of circular practices in ensuring almost zero waste generation and discuss policies to enable the smooth adoption 
uh, of circular economy principles in the area. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so just a little bit of the background. The APEC uh, region has not been spared from the impacts of um, the waste crisis and leaders of the region have repeatedly voiced their concerns um, over the issue. Uh, they identified the need for better waste uh, management uh, and called for more work in this area in their um, 2015 and 2016 declarations. And similarly, concerns for better management of resources and um, management of resources um, were echoed in the 2017 APEC leaders declaration. And more recently, um, APEC, the APEC Chile uh, 2019 priority on sustainable growth uh, has looked into marine debris prevention and reduction with a specific focus on plastics. Um, and uh, at the uh, host, uh, as the host economy of 2020, Malaysia also recognized the concept of uh, circular economy as a sub priority within their driving innovate, uh, innovative sustainability uh, priority pillar. So this work within APEC is an indication um, of the importance of uh, a regional approach in addressing the waste crisis and helps explain uh, how transitioning to a circular economy can aid in um, improving the waste crisis and pursuing sustainable growth. Next, please. Uh, so the waste crisis picture um, globally, as well as in APEC is as seen from the slide. Uh, waste um, as um, uh, defined in, in this presentation as uh, any product or material that is disposed in the process of consumption and production and may include solid, uh, liquid, gases, um, recycle, recyclable and organic waste. Waste generation um, is a major global problem that is worsening by the day. Uh, growing population, rising affluence uh, and rapid urbanization unsupported by proper waste management systems uh, has driven this global waste crisis. And the World Bank estimates that annual global uh, solid waste generation will rise by 69% uh, between uh, from 2 billion tons in 2016 to 3.4 billion tons in 2015. And uh, high income economies contribute one third of global waste, although they account for only 16% of the world population. On the other hand, uh, global uh, uh, lower income economies generate increasingly more waste per person per capita, an issue that is particularly um, worsened by inefficient waste management uh, systems and lack of awareness. Next slide, please. Uh, while APEC economies are responsible uh, for a large share of solid waste, that is, um, 43% of global solid waste um, in 2016, and projection, projections from the World Bank show increasing trends over the uh, next 30 years until 2015. Sorry, it was the last slide, but it's okay. Um, on, although lower than, um, than uh, their share in 2016, APEC economies are still expected to be responsible for a significant 37% of global solid waste in 2015. And um, according to data, again, from the World Bank, about 59% of waste in APEC economies was mismanaged, that is uh, dumped into unspecified, unspecified um, landfills, open dumps, waterways, or other unaccounted locations. And um, 66%, a large portion of this mismanaged waste uh, arose from developing APEC economies. And um, these uh, waste, mismanaged waste, uh, bear large costs to health and economy. Uh, poorly managed waste um, apparently com contaminates uh, the oceans, breeds diseases, releases harmful greenhouse gases and litters landscapes, um, for example, 
uh, mismanaged waste, including plastics, are dumped into uh, inland waterways, which then empty into the oceans. And um, a 2017 study found that about 90% of the ocean's plastic comes from 10 rivers, of which six flow through uh, APEC economies. And uh, according to uh, a research in uh, 2011, all these plastics in the oceans are expected to cost uh, 1.3 billion US dollar per annum to the tour tourism, fishing and shipping industries in the APEC region. And although the health cost of missed uh, managed waste has not been calculated for the APEC region, a recent work um, in uh, 2019 found that uh, about 400,000 to 1 million re residents in developing economies die every year due to the harmful effects of mismanaged uh, plastic waste. Next slide, please. Uh, not just harmful to health, uh, mismanaged wa waste is also e economically inefficient. Uh, a study in 2016 of five APEC economies, namely China, Indonesia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam, found that uh, mismanaged household waste cost uh, the economy approximately uh, three, uh, 375 US dollar per ton. And um, the same uh, a study, another study in 2018 of the same region, um, show that implementing an integrated uh, waste management system for the same region of five um, economies would cost only 50 to 100 US dollar per ton and is therefore at least four times more economical than um, the cost of mismanaged um, household waste. And also waste is not um, supportive of future economic growth since resource security and efficiency are necessary for economic resilience. Um, uh, next slide, please. Thank you. So um, the, apparently the direct impact of waste on uh, livelihoods and the economy are well-known and self-evident. Uh, but the waste we throw away is also coming around, including in our food. Um, economies, firms, uh, and households often practice a linear model of production that uh, follows a take, make, and dispose pattern. Uh, and in this linear uh, model, uh, raw materials uh, are extracted from nature, uh, transformed into products, and consumed. And un any unneeded byproducts or residual residual matter are then disposed as waste. Now the circular economy, on the other hand, closes the loop so that almost no residual re residual waste uh, is released into the environment. Um, next slide, please. So this is the most extensive, in this most extensive form, the circular economy comprises 10 stages uh, shown as the 9R uh, framework. Uh, the reason why it's uh, 9R instead of 10 is that we have a R0 step, that is refuse. Uh, basically the strategy of refusing is to avoid the use of raw materials by abandoning the function of the product. For example, avoid packaging where possible. Uh, these are the stand stages, uh, the nine R framework of uh, circular economy. Uh, I would give some example of, uh, uh, for example, re rethink. Uh, an example of rethinking is um, share the shared use of products like vehicles, uh, washing machines, basically trying to make the use of a product more intensive. Um, reduce, uh, reuse uh, are probably something we're familiar with. Uh, repair is something uh, I guess is familiar in daily life, but we um, may uh, underestimate 
prepare as uh, a strategy. Basically, uh, we try to prepare a defective product so that it could be used uh, for its original function. Um, refurbish and remanufacturing uh, are the same strategies, but on an upgraded uh, level. For example, uh, instead of repairing a um, defective part of uh, a, a product, instead of, an, of buying a new product, refurbishing um, involves redesigning and restoring an old product. Uh, for example, refurbish an electronics product by replacing the old parts with the new ones. Repurpose uh, involves reusing functional discarded parts to manufacture a new product with a different function. Uh, for example, using a functional lap a part of a laptop to manufacture a digital pen. Uh, the, the last um, stages of uh, the 9R framework in includes uh, recycle and uh, recover. So as much as we're familiar with recycle, recover basically uh, involves, um, for example, using the heat from, uh, from combustion to drive a gener uh, generators to produce uh, electricity. So basically um, using leftover material and um, recover energy. Next slide please. So uh, pursuing the creation of um, our circular economy has its benefits as well as barriers. So um, it, uh, pursuing uh, our, our circular economy has uh, three main benefits. The first one is that uh, an economy or a region would become less dependent on external sources uh, or uh, of materials. Um, population growth and increasing affluence have strained the supply of raw materials, while natural disasters and trade tensions have demonstrated the vulnerability of supply chains to external shocks. So adopting a circular economy would reduce uncertainties over the domestic supply of scarce uh, resources. The second advantage of a circular economy is um, the generation of new types of employment and businesses. New business model could emerge from existing businesses that tweak their practices uh, to be more envir environmentally friendly. For example, a milk company that collects uh, milk bottles from customers for reuse or a phone manufacturer that processes old phones uh, for retrieval of usable parts. Uh, the European uh, Commission ex expects our circular economy to generate uh, nearly 600,000 new jobs within Europe uh, in areas like product development, research, innovative designs, and business models. And the third major benefit of a circular economy lies in the potential um, reduction in environmental uh, degradation. Uh, the over-reliance uh, on uh, of economic growth on natural resources has driven an un unsustainable demand for raw materials. And without any intervention, the uh, United Nations Environment, Environment Program expects a 200% increase in the consumption of minerals, fossil fuels, and ores between 2000 and uh, 2015. And this circular economy provides opportunities for reducing the pressure on natural resources, not only through uh, sharing and recycling, but also by expanding the life cycle of products and their parts through the reuse, repair, refurbish, man re manufacture, and repurpose. Um, on the other hand, despite the benefits, there are evident uh, barriers to setting up a circular economy. Uh, the first, uh, probably most um, uh, observable uh, barrier is the high upfront cost in, um, expected in the short run when uh, revamping business practices and investing in necessary infrastructure. Uh, the second uh, barrier uh, 
points to how a, a circular economy will um, will lead uh, to a more complex international supply chains because resources flow in both directions. Uh, for this, greater cooperation across businesses would allow for better management of these supply chains. Uh, the third um, barrier is, the, is that the transition to a circular economy requires the sharing of smart infrastructure and advanced technologies that is often hindered by weak intellectual property rights and data privacy concerns. And finally, uh, the profitability of circular economy requires a strong demand from consumers, uh, which only arise uh, if consumers are more and better informed about the concept uh, and can easily recognize a business circularity. Next slide, please. So, um, the COVID pandemic apparently uh, highlighted the world's interconnect uh, interconnectedness and it showed how a virus can quickly circle the globe and how policy decisions made years ago can affect us now. So during the, uh, the pandemic, um, it was apparently a time for businesses and governments to rethink traditional business models and um, firms, uh, res uh, results, research results have shown that firms that apply circular economy principles have shown their ability to address short-term supply shortages while reducing waste. Uh, here are the five uh, business models for circular economy. So rethinking business models in terms of the circular economy presents opportunities for efficiency, innovation, and sustainability. Um, for example, we have uh, one, uh, the first business model is sharing platforms, basically facilitate access to and uh, use and the shared use of underutilized products. Uh, libraries are uh, one of the most traditional form uh, or example of sharing platform or laundromats or another and um, some industries have also adopted rentals as their business model for example bike sharing uh, ride hailing or uh, coal living and uh, co-working space provides uh, uh, arrangements for people to share limited living and working spaces reducing the demand for real estate. The second model um, is um, product as a service, basically focusing on maxima maximizing the user's the user, uh, derived from a product rather than the number of physical units of a product sold. Uh, this incentivizes firms to build products that are more durable and flexible for future maintenance and upgrades. Um, unlike sharing platforms, product as a service clients subscribe to a service from the seller, uh, which means they would have the access to the services on demand, for example, uh, Netflix or Spotify. Uh, the third model, a business model, uh, is circular supplies. Uh, businesses have implemented the idea, this idea uh, by designing products that are recyclable and reusable. Um, waste can be repurposed. For example, empty pasta, uh, pasta sauce bottles could be used as a pen holders, uh, while old fabric could be stitched into bags and purposes. The fourth uh, business model uh, is product life extension, which is another strategy to support the transition to a, uh, to a circular economy. It entails um, efforts to prolong the use, uh, the, the useful life of uh, an item to reduce the demand for a product. And the final um, business model uh, is resource recovery, uh, which reduces waste by utilizing manufacturing byproducts from other production processes. And the concept 
of resource recovery does not have to be constrained to the same industry. For example, uh, Nike captures waste in other sectors and incorporates uh, the waste into their production processes. For example, plastic waste from single-use packaging such as plastic bottles can be processed into polyester fabric, which can be used in textile manufacturing. In fact, in 28, um, 2018, 75% of all shoes and apparels produced by Nike contain some form of recycled material. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, the circular economy uh, is dependent on international trade with some economies and um, the OECD even going as far as to consider a trade as a fundamental aspect of the circular economy. And there are two apparent reasons for this. Uh, the first is skill and uh, specialization. And the second is intercon interconnectedness. Uh, first is the need for skill. skill. At various uh, stages of the circular economy, there is a need for experts and technologies specializing in uh, refurbishing, repurpo repurposing, or recycling used goods, or recovering energy after all other options have been exhausted. And uh, at the economy level, the cost involved in building these ca uh, capabilities may be significant due to the lack of skill and the specializations needed. And trade provides business opportunities by enabling economies to use the specializations and innovations available to, in other economies and by providing them access to a larger market, market to benefit from economies of scale. Um, the second reason uh, has to do with inter, the interconnectedness of global value uh, supply chains. In today's uh, highly globalized and dependent world economy, global supply uh, and value chains are deeply interlinked and uh, a major, a majority of products were, uh, are made of intermediate parts sourced from other economies. And as, as a result, the capacity of a business or industry to embrace circular economy will depend on the ability of its partners to abide by the same principles of circularity. And as trade in sustainable goods and services grow, some economies have strengthened their standards to support these industries, requiring that their trading partners uh, adopt similar standards. Yeah, next slide, please. Um, well, APEC apparently can contribute to the transition to a circular economy and regional cooperation has an apparent role. Um, some areas that APEC can work on are encouraging uh, the standardization of processes, technologies and materials involved in the circular economy. Uh, disseminating information about the circular economy and event, um, elevating our circular economy related discussions to a higher level. Um, first, involving standardization, new technologies and circular economy infrastructure require that standardization needs to be in place to ensure common practice, common protocols, across economies and businesses, and especially to maintain quality across highly globalized supply chains. Um, second, um, the region uh, needs to encourage adoption of uh, circular practices. And um, to do that, there is a need to develop policies that incentivize businesses to think about the sustainability of the product or service at all points along the supply chain and across the whole duration of the <clears throat> of the product life cycle. Excuse me. And um, the third uh, policy consideration involved uh, setting a credible benchmark. 
um, it is necessary to measure the circular economy, to recognize progress and set global benchmarks that businesses and economies can work towards. Uh, some existing uh, indicators can be used to guide circular economy policies. For example, carbon, carbon emissions, life cycle analysis and resource intensity. Um, and uh, finally, uh, raising public awareness and education is critical. Uh, to encourage change, there is a need to change people's mindset and that starts with education. Um, circular economy oriented thinking should be introduced early at schools uh, to ensure students are equipped with the technical and creative skills necessary for the new economy. For example, in Finland, circular economy education begins very early. Uh, children are taught to think about food waste and uh, waste sorting in daycare centers. And uh, final slide, please. Thank you. So when should, when should the world transition? When should we act? And uh, apparently the COVID pandemic again has exacerbated the waste crisis as well as um, highlighting how interconnected we are and uh, how influential, how impactful one economy's um, policy could be on others. And um, however, the COVID pandemic was also a chance for economies to rethink our ways towards uh, more sustainable development. Um, recovery, uh, recovery, recovery plans should not only be concerned about um, economic, um, reviving the economic output, but also towards building environmental sustainability. Yeah, that was uh, the end to my uh, presentation. Um, thank you for uh, attending and for your attention. I look forward to more questions in the Q&A and the discussion that follows. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Nguyen, for a very uh, comprehensive discussion of uh, the circular economy, um, looking at all, um, beginning from uh, a definition and the, the impetus of um, the waste crisis, uh, moving uh, next to the uh, nine R's framework. And uh, uh, thank you for introducing to us the R0, uh, refuse, refusing to use um, some um, materials in order to uh, reduce our uh, consumption. And then, of course, we heard about the benefits and the barriers to um, adopting the circular economy framework and also the role of um, the opportunities and uh, like new businesses, such as the sharing platform and looking at uh, products as a service. Uh, finally, we heard about uh, the role of uh, regional cooperation, such as APEC, and uh, the role of trade uh, uh, an import, as an important and a fundamental aspect of the circular economy. So having heard about that, um, we now transition to a discussion of how do we fund uh, financing a circular economy. And, and so uh, to discuss this, that for us, we have Patrick Schroeder of the um, sorry, uh, Patrick Schroeder of uh, the uh, Environmental and Society Program of the Chatham House. He leads the research and engagement on the circular economy, covering topics such as the role of the circular economy for the SDGs and human development and national policies. He holds a PhD in environmental studies from the Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. Uh, Dr. Schroeder, the floor is yours. Yes, good morning. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes, um, very well. Great. Yeah, thank you also for, yeah, for inviting me to join today's meeting. I think that's very, um, very timely, um, important topic. Um, so as, as you mentioned, I will talk about a report. One of the areas that we're looking at um, how to finance circular economy innovations and businesses, um, but also how to finance circular economy and international development cooperation. We published a report uh, on this last year. I'll, I'll put the, um, the link into the chat um, so you can um, 
uh, downloaded from here. And um, uh, just let me share my screen. Um, I can and start the presentation. So I hope you can see this. Um, so uh, when we talk about this, uh, uh, the circular economy, we, we try to talk about um, an inclusive circular economy, uh, which means we not only try to look at how the circular economy can address issues around waste and resource efficiency, but also how the circular economy can be used to address issues around working conditions, social inclusion, um, and in the SDG context, also uh, addressing issues of, of poverty reduction. Um, and in terms of financing um, for this presentation, I'll, as I mentioned, run through the paper that we published, but I was also aiming to talk a little bit about um, uh, finance taxonomies and in the specific context, what's happening in, in the EU. Um, the reason for this is that we see these uh, taxonomies that are being developed as, as really important um, frameworks uh, that will also um, be needed to accelerate investments into circular models. Um, in terms of the report that we published, um, so here, here are some of the key messages. Um, so we found that circular economy finance becoming more sophisticated. Um, more and more companies are adopting it. Um, especially because there's uh, increasing pressure and demand from uh, shareholders. Not only shareholders, but also stakeholders. Um, we took this photo of Extinction Rebellion in front of the Bank of England. Um, uh, yeah, there's increasing pressure on the financial sector to really shift towards sustainability, not only uh, for net zero, but also addressing other environmental issues. Um, and another finding that we also um, covered in the report is the issues um, of um, policy instruments. Policy is really important um, to shift um, finance uh, investments, especially because circular economy is still considered um, high risk investments. So what's needed to increase investor confidence are policies that are supportive. Um, and these can include uh, national action plans, or targets on resource efficiency or waste reduction, um, extended producer responsibility, various uh, taxation me uh, measures or other uh, uh, economic incentives can also be useful. Um, we also found that currently most investments into circular economy go into high income countries. Um, then what we try to emphasize is that we also need to have uh, investments um, going into low and middle income countries, which is uh, important not only uh, for SDGs, but also for COVID recovery. And since then, actually, we've seen that many of the large multilateral development banks have, have started including circular economy into their programs. Um, yes, we, we also make the point of uh, including issues around just transitions. We know just transitions uh, from the energy transition, but it will be also important for the uh, circular economy transition. And, and finally, um, as I mentioned, so green taxonomies are really good opportunity uh, to create binding and commonly adopted financial standards and, and guidelines for circular economy investments. Um, so we've tried also to quantify uh, overall how much circular economy uh, finance is compared to the overall um, investment situation. Here's some figures that you see. So we estimated, and, and I need to say these are estimates because the data is still very poor, um, especially the data that is publicly available. Um, and we need to improve this uh, situation about, about data uh, across the board for circular economy. So um, we split this according to government, uh, then trying to include some of the stimulus packages, corporate spending, and then um, uh, the financial sector. 
and as you see, um, so corporate and, and governments um, make the main share in total about 1.5 trillion over the period 2019-2020, um, which sounds a lot, but if we look at this um, in the overall government spending or corporate spending, it's still very um, little. So if we really want to shift from a linear to a circular system, uh, we also need to shift the finance. Uh, we've looked at some of the available sustainable finance instruments that we have, the uh, green bonds, transition bonds, sustainability linked bonds and bonds and ESG investing and, and how far they're relevant for the circular economy. And there's various aspects which is already emerging that we can see. Um, so these are very good um, developments. Uh, and depending on the sector and um, different um, financial instruments might be more suitable. Um, I, will, I will go through this more quickly um, because of time, I think. Um, so we also, also try to understand where does circular investment go and the majority goes into uh, circular, uh, circular business models, more than 60%. Um, and, and what does that actually mean, circular business models? Um, that that uh, covers investments in, in companies that want to transition uh, to more circular activities um, or uh, that want to create new circular technologies or products. So that doesn't necessarily mean that all these businesses are already fully circular, but they are on a transition journey from a linear to a, to a circular model. And then there's these other areas here in, in terms of um, resource efficiency and infrastructure. Um, so some on plastics factoring and waste and recycling. Uh, in terms of the SDGs, we also try to understand the link between different uh, finance mechanisms that exist um, and how these could be leveraged uh, for various circular economy solutions that some of this we've heard about in previous pre presentations and other links to the SDGs. Um, so there's a number of um, important uh, mechanisms that could be used. And uh, maybe one, one thing to highlight is uh, the role of um, public blended finance um, seems to be quite, uh, quite important. Again, this is the de-risking factor. Um, if government can provide um, uh, some um, public finance uh, to leverage then private investment and, and um, reduce the risks for, for the private sector to invest in these models. Um, th this seems to be a very um, important way forward at this stage. Um, we've tried to also understand the finance around renewable energy and how to integrate circularity into uh, renewable energy finance. Um, one reason for this is because the renew new re renewable energy sector is currently being developed based on linear mindset without considerations of the way steps generated um, uh, further down the line, um, plus also the risks of um, the resource intensity of, of the energy transition. So uh, a wide range of new materials and metals will be needed um, as we phase out uh, fossil fuel um, <coughs> power generation and um, the opportunities um, to include circularity in, in this um, system um, and also in this slide here, uh, taking it from a risk perspective again, um, uh, to create also these circular solutions to reduce financial risks and create actually also new, new business opportunities for um, uh, additional uh, value chains around uh, renewable energy technologies. So then um, coming to the taxonomy, um, so this is currently happening in the EU, but not only, uh, many other countries as well, as including um, the ASEAN also has a uh, taxonomy that was launched end of last year. And um, the purpose of this taxonomy is to uh, really guide the financial sector towards more sustainable um, investment decisions. Um, and in the EU, it's specifically linked to the circular economy. 
Uh, here's a brief timeline. So it's been under development for quite a while. And um, so we already towards the implementation process. Uh, so it will be fully operational by 2023. Um, and so from this year, what started uh, are the climate objectives. They are the priority, but then all the other environmental objectives will also be become relevant in uh, 2023. Um, so it will affect a range of actors, including um, companies, the financial market uh, participants, uh, but also the public sector. And this is uh, what I mentioned here with the environmental objectives. So there's six of those. And um, you can see the transition to a circular economy is one of those um, six objectives. Uh, although, obviously, um, the transition the circular economy will also have benefits for pollution prevention and control, but also for climate mitigation, um, as well as uh, protecting marine uh, resources. So they are, um, these are not necessarily separate uh, objectives, but interconnected. And um, maybe moving forward, there's these, uh, this is um, how specific criteria uh, are being de developed, starting with the environmental objective, then looking at economic sectors um, and, and uh, activities, then identifying uh, the types of substantial contribution uh, uh, to the objective, um, uh, points of reference, and then the uh, specific criteria. So this is uh, quite a technical process um, the taxonomy is going through. Um, and yeah, the overall, maybe the overall goal to mention here, um, the circular economy especially contributes to these, um, uh, especially the, the aim to reduce uh, used material footprint by 50% by 2030 and 75% by 2050. Um, so uh, there's an objective also on the uh, circular material use rate of all materials. Um, and uh, so, yes, Basically, having set, set these high-level targets uh, means it ne then becomes important to identify which investments uh, contribute to this um, or not. Um, here's a model of the circular economy that's uh, used in, in the uh, context of the, um, of the taxonomy. Uh, it's looking at circular design models, optimal use models, value recovery models, and circular support models. Um, then he, this is how the specific circularity criteria are, are being selected. Um, this is an overview of how the substan substantial contribution to the transition to circular economy is, is being looked at. either through the on performance by reducing environmental pressures. And you have um, um, from this slide, these top three uh, categories uh, looked at here, and then um, enabling activities, uh, basically circular, su uh, circular support models, which is, includes also um, issues around uh, providing uh, better data on uh, resource use and, and waste flows, et cetera. Um, I won't go into detail here, but uh, these are, this is a very detailed list about um, the substantial contributions, uh, what classifies as an activity uh, that falls under this uh, um, classification. Um, this is the second slide of this um, with more, with a wider list. And um, again, too much to go through at the moment, uh, but if the PowerPoint can be shared later. Um, uh, so these are quite important um, subcategories of, of what can be, um, can be used. And then finally, this is my last slide. Uh, so the important thing um, for international cooperation, um, and, and this was highlighted again previously, how, how important international co collaboration is for the circular economy, uh, is the alignment between different taxonomies. So the EU's uh, taxonomy is not the only one. 
the UK is actually you know, also looking at um, a, a, a sustainable finance taxonomy, but um, there's also one uh, that's being developed in China, but as I mentioned, also the ASEAN taxonomy from November 2021. 20, uh, um, so uh, this is an ongoing process and um, hopefully in this context, there can be closer dialogue and cooperation between um, APEC, ASEAN and, and Europe uh, on the circular economy finance, but generally more widely on circular economy policy exchanges and, uh, and other issues around trade as well. So um, that's all for me. Um, if you have any questions, this is my email, you can uh, write to me and um, feel free to download the report. I, I hope you find that useful. Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you, doc Dr. Schrauder, for a uh, very detailed discussion of um, uh, financing the digital economy and the role of the taxonomy. Um, I, I particularly uh, find it interesting that uh, you mentioned the key role of uh, policy instruments as uh, um, in order to de-risk uh, and incentivize uh, financial investments. Uh, and uh, you mentioned, um, I think I would um, ask uh, this as a question of mine because um, uh, circular economy investments are viewed as a uh, high risk investment. So maybe I just would like uh, later in the open forum uh, when I enter the, uh, when I open the floor for questions, uh, let me also take the opportunity to ask um, the question on how how can uh, policy instruments or specific policy instruments, especially for developing countries that have little room for um, uh, maneuvering uh, certain um, policies to um, the risk um, financial investment uh, uh, or incentivize uh, financial investments um, uh, target. So maybe late, um, so given that, uh, maybe it's time to open the floor uh, to some questions. And uh, may I invite all our speakers to, in, uh, to open their uh, uh, videos so that we can um, invite them to uh, answer some of these questions. I have received a question uh, from uh, Facebook. Uh, very interestingly, um, may I ask, uh, Dr. Lily, because it's uh, specifically uh, asking about the uh, uh, BCG as, a, a, as an umbrella, uh, umbrella concept no, of uh, combining the circular economy, bioeconomy, and the green economy. But the question is, um, uh, let me just read the question. So the Umbrella concepts like this can synergize individual strengths to address individual weaknesses, but can it can also face trade-offs because of uh, in the, the differences in the concepts. You know? uh, for instance, the production and use of biofuels is a key topic in the um, bioeconomy, but biofuels can conflict with uh, green economy as the use of uh, ecosystems. Specifically, biofuels production may require converting forest land to agricultural land. So how can we reconcile trade-offs like this to successfully implement the BCG uh, model? Uh, right. Thank you. Thank you for the question. I think that is a very good question and a very good point uh, that people who are working or countries that are uh, you know, moving towards the using the bioenergy are facing like food or fuels or, you know, like how we can manage that. And of course, I think the, uh, I mean, to, to make the answer short, I think the all sector has to come together and, uh, you know, contribute into this solution. And, uh, you know, information are very important in these cases. Uh, the, the government has to monitor, you know, the, the number of waste uh, that we actually have in the system. So we don't have to like, you know, grow the land, especially uh, grow the plants, especially just to, you know, use that for fuel or anything like that. So I think that's kind of, uh, you know, basically if we, I want to make a chart, it's just like the, the all sector has to come together. They have to actually work together on how to balance like, you know, the use of the plants, 
for fields or for food, as well as, you know, how can we target the use of agricultural waste rather than, the, you know, using the, the, the one that we can use for food. That's one thing. And of course, the technology and, uh, you know, science and research has to follow that because, you know, everyone knows in this area that using the agricultural waste as fuel is not simple because it's actually full of like, you know, cellulosic, um, you know, materials. And it's not like simple as using the starch for fuel, for example. So that's one thing. And um, I mean, I can go on because, you know, there are other areas as well that we want to um, not just like focusing on uh, converting the uh, agricultural waste to fuel, but we also discuss about uh, fuel is the lowest price. You know, maybe it's not the best thing to convert your agricultural waste to fuel, but maybe you should consider, uh, you know, convert the agricultural waste to higher value products like, you know, biochemicals and others like bioplastic and other in the, you know, in the chains. So that's another area as well, not just, uh, you know, fuel. So I think I'll stop here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lily. Um, I, I understand that there's a lot of room, you know, but the, I think the main point is really to, to bring the stakeholders together in order to reach uh, a common ground. Uh, so I, I have a question. Uh, I think this was um, also uh, any of the speakers can discuss or, or answer this. And this has been highlighted in a number of presentations um, as, and also mentioned by Dr. Schroeder uh, earlier that there is really a lack or a need for a different kind of data in order for us to be able to fully explain and even provide evidence for the need to support the, the circular economy. So um, what is the role now of the statistical system or how can we um, tweak the current statistical system so that we would be able to fully support or and provide uh, evidence on uh, the circular economy. Um, please, uh, anyone, may I hear your thoughts? I can, I can, I can try. Um, so, I mean, it's on, it's on different levels. It's um, not, not just the national statistics maybe um although if you obviously as, as a government um want to set specific targets um on resource efficiency uh, for instance on um on waste generation uh, material footprint all of this um i think some of that macro data is, is already there um what becomes then more difficult if we break this down to uh, to the local level, for example, um, local governments often have have very um, very patchy data. So I think um, that's maybe something where also local governments needs uh, more support to be able to understand, um, yeah, kind of the the resource flows through their city or their their region. Um, but the, the data issue becomes also relevant for, um, uh, for companies. Um, so companies also have a role to play in, in getting, getting those data right about um, how, much, how much waste they generate, um, how, much, how much resources they, uh, they use during the processes, especially then when, um, because it's uh, not, um, because we know circular solutions can only work as a value chain approach. So you also need to look at the supply chain and then it becomes uh, even more difficult, especially uh, for small and medium-sized companies uh, to, to generate uh, uh, this, uh, this information. The, the reason why companies also need to get up to speed on, on this is because um, now with the taxonomy, for example, there will be new re reporting requirements um, so to be able to attract investments, companies need to be able to report on um, not only financial, uh, not only but um, not, not not just financial information, but also non-financial disclosure is, is becoming a, a very big um, uh, uh, trend that will start to be um, 
can be impacting uh, on, on many, many different industries. Um, maybe the, the last point on is also about uh, data on trade. So at the moment, it's also quite difficult to understand what is circular trade, what is linear trade. Um, so there are new different categories also in terms of the HS codes, which are used by the World uh, Trade Organization. Uh, so there's a role for customs as well to, uh, to generate better data of uh, what uh, goes in and out of uh, countries uh, in terms of um, waste trade. Uh, all this is obviously also key to track down on illicit trade and waste because we, we don't want to see the circular economy, shift to circular economy also provide opportunities for more illegal waste trade. Um, so that also needs to become uh, more transparent and, and uh, traceable. So yeah, sorry, it's long, so no, many uh, different uh, levels need to work on this. I, I think it's, it's good that you covered uh, the different types of data. No? So, so from data from at the macro level, and then which is um, almost available at uh, certain uh, points in time, uh, and even for a lot of countries, but then there's the local government data and even some uh, levels of um, trade data that, um, and even the reporting uh, that the way we collect data from businesses needs to be tweaked a little bit so that we can um, really identify the, the activities and uh, in order to be able to support the, uh, the financial uh, uh, investments on, on uh, how to invest in uh, circular acti uh, economy activities. Um, because we are running uh, short of time, um, maybe allow me now to just ask uh, each one of you uh, maybe some final points um, in order for me to uh, close the, the uh, open forum. Uh, so let me now begin with uh, Ms. Nguyen and then uh, Dr. Lili and then Dr. Patrick. Thank you, Dr. Kimba. Um, I guess um, I've um, I guess I've shown um, uh, the key points in the presentation. But uh, just to close, uh, I think the key is to call for actions from uh, multiple stakeholders on transitioning towards um, a um, circular economy, uh, especially in the APEC region. Who, um, which is uh, for now still responsible for a large part of uh, mismanaged uh, uh, waste. So um, yeah, that's uh, the key takeaway for me. Thank you, uh, Ms. Nguyen. Dr. Lili, please. Yes, I just want to second Ms. Nguyen about the collaboration and uh, importantly, the regional collaboration is especially very important and uh, and of course uh, because we have like the similar kind of resources biodiversity and we have similar kind of you know like um, economies so i think uh with science technology and innovation i think we uh, could work together hands in hand in asean in apec to you know move forwards with the issue uh, to make sure that we have a sustainable and resilient uh you know future for, for, for regions. So one of the things that I would like to encourage you to explore more about the ASEAN BCG network as well, because I think that would be the, one of the great platform to you know, encourage people to work together in this very important issue. Thank you. You, you for reminding us about the BCG network. That's something that uh, we in the region should uh, actually participate in. Uh, Dr. Patrick, uh, please, your final words. Yes, it, um, yeah, I very much um, agree also. Uh, uh, Dr. Lee just mentioned about the regional cooperation. I think that's really, uh, really important because we also see this regional cooperation, for example, in Latin America. There's a, um, a, an alliance there. Um, there's also an African circular economy alliance. Um, so countries are beginning to. Uh, to coordinate on, on the regional level. And obviously it's quite, for APEC ASEAN, that also very much a good step also on, uh, in terms of policy coordination. Um, I think that's, that's a, um, a really good approach. I also wanted to highlight um, Stockholm Plus 50 is coming up. 
um, sort of the uh, original first UN Environment and Development Conference took place in Stockholm in 1972, and now 50 years on uh, in June, there's a follow-up. And um, the circular economy will also feature uh, at, at that conference. So it will be um, an like it's an opportunity to leverage the circular economy also in the multilateral system. Um, so which will hopefully provide also some, some more momentum then for, um, uh, for actors around the world to, to shift from linear to circular. Uh, thank you everyone uh, for your uh, final words. And I think it's really true that this, the conversation does not end here. So um, there are still a lot of um, uh, initiatives and a lot of work that needs to be done at the national, um, regional, and even at the multilateral level, as Dr. Patrick has um, uh, mentioned, that the, the, the Stockholm uh, uh, has uh, reached uh, 50 years um, uh, now, uh, today. Uh, so given this, um, let me now end uh, session two. Uh, we've heard a lot uh, from the uh, BCG and the circular economy and even how to fund it and the need for uh, common uh, taxation, taxonomy for, for uh, across our countries and even in the region. So now may I turn over the floor to Abby uh, for our concluding uh, activities. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Kimba and esteemed speakers. Uh, before I turn over the floor for the closing remarks, I, let me just summarize the discussions quickly. So the presentations highlighted the role of the circular economy in supporting economic development through sustainable means and experiences, as well as business opportunities. The presenters also underscored the role of policy in promoting the adoption of circular models. The whole of government and society approach was also emphasized, noting that the collective effort by stakeholders is needed to reduce waste, close the loops, and promote economic development that is sustainable and inclusive. Highlight, they also highlighted that the role of APEC and regional integration is underscored. In general, to coordinate and support development. Education, as well as an updated and comprehensive data is needed to understand better the circular economy. Um, thank you. So with that, before we close the symposium, we would like to quickly flash a video message by Ambassador Jose Maria A. Carino, Director General of the Foreign Service Institute. PIDS President Aniceto Orbeta, Assistant Secretary Anne Cabochan, distinguished panel of speakers, esteemed guests from the Diplomatic Corps, friends from government, students and members of the Academy, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to one and all. As we conclude today's symposium, I would like to express my deepest appreciation to the organizing team and our partner organization, the Philippine Institute for Development Studies, for creating a platform where experts and scholars on circular economy can share their insights and exchange ideas. Indeed, the emergence of the circular economy is underpinned by the goal of fostering a regenerative system through transforming waste into productive inputs. This is hence expected to positively contribute to the collective fight against global warming and to the achievement of several sustainable development goals. Further, the circular economy is assumed to promote more sustainable economy economic and financial systems. Both sessions of the symposium underscore the significance of a whole of society approach and dynamic synergies in mainstreaming circular economy. We at the Foreign Service Institute sincerely hope 
that the main takeaways of today's symposium may serve as valuable inputs to the work and initiatives of PASCN members, key stakeholders, and partners in the APIC region. As the country welcomes our new administration, FSI remains committed to instilling confidence in the Philippine Foreign Service through responsive learning and development programs and timely research activities. Once again, thank you for joining the symposium and I hope you enjoy the rest of the afternoon. Thank you. Again, thank you so much for your people participation. Before we close, this is just a quick reminder to those attending the PASCN General Assembly at 1.30 p.m. to log in via Cisco WebEx and kindly be there five minutes before the wedding. Uh, again, thank you and we hope to see you again in our next events. For the copy of the presentations, please tune in at the PIDS and PASCN websites. Should you have any concerns, please email us at pids.gov.ph. Take care.